take up uh, Senate File 73 as number two, which is the cannabis provisions and modification. And then we will end, if we have time, Senator May Quaid, you have Senate File 1900. That'll be number three on the, on the list. Is that okay? You guys okay with me changing the uh, agenda? Um, any questions? We got that. So I'm going to head over to the front if um, we can get... Where's my vice chair? He's not here. So here. Yeah, you got that. I can give that to you. Well, Senator Hoffman, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate you, uh, you, you uh, gaveling us in. Senate file 1830 is the medical assistance reimbursement rates increased for home care nursing. Um, I have with me Cameo Zender, uh, Chief Administrator Officer for the Pediatric Home Services. In case you guys have never taken a tour of Pediatric Home Services, I, I, would, I would suggest that you do it during Halloween. Um, because uh, there's a certain individual that helped co-found that company. Um, their son dresses up as a werewolf. Um, isn't that correct, Cameo? That is correct. Thank sir. you. So we're here today, uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, to bring awareness to the situation we're at home with, uh, with home care nursing in Minnesota. The service is critical to families, the economy, and to nurses. Currently, um, nurses are paid 35 to 55% more working in a hospital than what they can be paid in home care. Um, that's based, uh, members, you want to know, it's based on a restrictive reimbursement structure, so making recruitment and retention nearly impossible. Pediatric Home Services has been working alongside legislators since 2014 on reforming the reimbursement model and paying nurses for their skill set instead of the environment in which they practice. It costs about $5,000 a day um, to care for a child in the NICU. A recent study in 2021 found that average delays experiencing by nursing shortages were around 94 days. This means each child in the hospital awaiting discharge could require upwards of $450,000 in avoidable health care spending in, if nursing were available at home, each child. $450,000. Home care is a more cost-effective option for these kids. And what we're simply saying in this bill is that we increase payment rates by 55% for home care nursing services and support recruitment and retention efforts. We must address this critical system failure and keep nurses, um, that, that is keeping nurses out of home care and keeping kids in the hospital. And so um, with that, Mr. Chair, note that we have a gentleman named Gilbert who is uh, skipping, skipping his classes in, in Rochester, and he's up here with his parents. And, and of course, Claire, who seven years ago, um, it was her birthday when we were doing a, a bill on that. So with that, Mr. Chair and members, is um, Cameo Zender. Uh, Ms. Zender, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Members of the committee, my name is Cameo Zender. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer with Pediatric Home Service. I have had the honor of uh, talking with you uh, in different uh, forms many times before, so I'm going to be brief because I really want you to have a longer opportunity to hear from a family, two families, and as well from a physician. Uh, I usually come up here and, and provide you with some evidence or some data to give sound reasoning to our request, and I'm happy to continue to do that. Uh, but uh, what I really want to say is how grateful we are for the support that we have found in the Senate to ensure that children with medical complexities are getting the care that they need. Uh, you have heard us, and I am grateful for that. Uh, so we will continue to do our work to bring the same message uh, to other uh, members of, of our state so that together we can solve for this pay disparity where, as Chair Hoffman describes, uh, we're, only, we're asking nurses to sacrifice uh, to be practicing that same level of ICU care, but uh, for our kids in their home where we want them to be, where they can be achieving their best lives. 50% of what they would earn uh, if they were practicing that outstanding skill in the hospital. We know that the pay increase alone is not going to be the magic bullet, but it is without it, there is nothing more that we can do uh, to make improvements or innovations in the care model. So thank you again for your support. Uh, and uh, I will invite uh, Dr. Brooke Moore 
uh, here to testify. Uh, Dr. Moore, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Thanks for allowing me this opportunity. Um, I am a pediatric pulmonologist and chief. Well, you have to say your name because we I, oh, I I already said it. your name, but then just make it system oh, say happy. it officially. Like, welcome to bureaucracy and government. Like, <laughs> you have to say the name we already know, but go ahead. I mean, medicine's not a lot different, <laughs> but thank you. I'm Dr. Brooke Moore. Uh, I'm a pediatric pulmonologist and chief of staff at Children's Minnesota. I'm here today because change is needed in the way home nurses are compensated and their care is reimbursed. As a pediatric pulmonologist, I take care of medically complex technology dependent children who often require chronic ventilation. One of my main objectives in my job is to help kids uh, that I care for to get strong enough to be able to transition to home and be with their families. We know kids do best in all aspects of their lives from development to their overall well-being when they are home with their families. Shortages of home nursing care are delaying discharges and altering our medical practice. At any one time at Children's, we have four to five patients who remain hospitalized awaiting home nursing. A child who is ventilator dependent requires a trained caregiver to be awake with them 24 seven. Despite our best efforts to train family members, most families do not have the means or ability to care for their children at home without some nursing support. Currently, as has been mentioned, nurses are paid 35 to 55% more working in a hospital than what is paid to work in the home setting because of restrictive reimbursement structures. Nurses deserve to be paid for their skill set, not the environment where they practice. The significant delays in discharge that we are experiencing across all Minnesota hospitals keep stable patients from transitioning home while limiting the number of beds available for new patients. A study in 2019 found that the average delay experienced because of the nursing shortage in Minnesota was around 54 days. That data was refreshed in 2021, as Senator Hoffman referenced, to uh, show that discharge was delayed on an average of 94 days at a cost of about $450,000. That trend continues today. Tomorrow, we will discharge a patient from Children's who waited 120 extra days to be discharged from the hospital due to a lack of home nursing. Four additional months of unnecessary time in the hospital. That's approximately $600,000 of additional hospital or healthcare costs for one patient alone. Multiply that by the other four that we have waiting to go home. That's roughly $2.4 million in the last six months alone. Due to socioeconomic burden, these delays often disproportionately impact our patients of color and children who are in government health care assistance. Our practice has been doing our part. We've been creative in trying to get kids home. We've sent kids home for the first time in a 36-year practice without any nursing care. I'd love if those parents were here today to tell you about how terrifying it was to bring their child home without nursing. Where possible, we've allowed families to have extended family members and friends be trained in their child's care. We've incorporated emergency simulation into their training that's usually used to train nurses. We've weaned children's support aggressively while they're in the hospital. But unfortunately, not all families have community support to bring their kids home nor can they financially afford to neglect their own employment to care for their child. And some children cannot be weaned aggressively. In addition to discharge delays because of a lack of home nursing, we've experienced delays because of a change in our clinical practice. We're keeping children on different types of respiratory support for longer, recognizing there won't be home nurses to care for them working to avoid tracheostomy placement and chronic ventilation, and thus the need for home nursing care. Although this sometimes can support their pulmonary health, it impacts their global development significantly and adds to length of stay and healthcare costs. It is more important than ever that we address the critical flaw in the system that is keeping nurses out of home care and keeping kids in the hospital. I ask you to approve SF1830 to do what's right for Minnesota's most, most medically complex children, healthcare professionals, hospitals, and our economy so kids can get the right care they need at the right place and the right time. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, and then we have two parents, I think. So maybe Dr. Moore and Ms. Zender, if you want to step aside. Stay near, we might want to talk to you again. But um, so if um, 
Ms. Goodchild and Ms. Stanfield want to come up? I presume you're both here. If you want to come up with any size group you want to bring with you, that would be awesome as well. So. Hi. Hi. So, yeah, please introduce yourself, and okay. we're um, so happy right. you're here. I just was going to wait for them. But, yes, my name is Tiffany Goodchild. Thank you for having me. Um, I am the proud mother of and fierce advocate for our son, Carter. I'm here today to talk to you about how crucial home care nursing is to families like ours and to ask that you help ensure medically complex kids across the state of Minnesota have adequate care by passing this bill. Home care nurses are critical to the health and safety of our son, um, as well as the quality of life for our family. And here's why. Um, this is Carter. He's not here today. He's at home. Um, but he was born with an unexpected, massive brain injury, which resulted in irreversible damage to 90% of his cortex. He was not expected to survive. And despite having a shortened life expectancy, Carter continues to prove this prognosis wrong. His official diagnosis is spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy, which leads to a host of medical issues, including um, epilepsy, which is a seizure condition, chronic respiratory infections. He's G-tube dependent. Um, he's got several neuromuscular challenges and limited mobility, to name a few. Of course, we're grateful that he is here, but make no mistake, this life is hard and has required much sacrifice. I've given up my promising career in special education administration to be Carter's primary caretaker. We weren't able to secure any type of home care support until he was three years old. It's important to understand after three years of constant caregiving while also raising other children, I was depleted. During this time, I was not able to care for myself because I didn't have anyone that could care for Carter. He needs a nursing level skill set. When we finally secured the support through Pediatric Home Service in 2019, it gave me all the hope, but it has not been without challenges. We started with overnight nursing, but in less than two years, we cycled through 28 nurses. Just as soon as we would get someone trained in, they would leave for a higher paying hospital job. This left us with open shifts, insurmountable stress, sleepless nights, and broken care for Carter. It was common for our schedule to only cover about 40% of the required shifts. In 2021, we made the decision to switch from overnight shifts to day shifts with our home care nursing team. When we have them, our team of nurses are incredible. They are the most valuable resource we have. When Carter is ill, which can be often, nurses provide the hospital level care that only a skilled nurse can. Unlike hospital nurses, our home care nurses do everything related to his care. They draw up and administer medications. They implement his hospital level respiratory plan with hospital grade interventions. They monitor and respond to seizures, which can be life threatening. But most importantly, they keep him safe and comfortable. Without our home care nurses, Carter would have been hospitalized eight times in the past six months. Um, instead, he's received the vast majority of his hospital level care right at home. It's important to understand patients truly get better care when they can be kept at home. Carter's more comfortable and sleeps better, which only helps him recover more quickly. When we have nursing, I can step back and be his mom, not his caregiver. When our nurse is here, I have peace of mind that he's safe at home while also having the ability to be present with my other three children. Sorry. Oh, you're, you're doing great. I'm Take nervous. I'm going to keep yeah. going though. <laughs> Uh, awesome. You see, home care nursing not only provides stability for my son's health, um, but also my mental health and for the, the function of our family as a whole. Our nurses go to school with him, which allows the educators to focus on teaching him new skills rather than his medical cares. When he's not ill, the nurses respect and follow our philosophy of care. They keep his body healthy by utilizing a variety of, of adaptive equipment. They keep his neuromuscular health strong by doing range of motion stretching every day. They help his cognitive development by using his eye gaze communication device. They are the difference maker in our family and in his life. Unfortunately, retention has greatly impacted his continuity of care and the function of our entire family. Our schedule has fluctuated from 40% to 70% coverage this year. Our concerns with turnover and retention are directly related to the inequity of pay. Home care nurses deserve to be compensated for the value and skills they provide. Ultimately, home care agencies cannot compete with hospital level pay, and it's the kids and families who suffer because of it. It needs to change. Families like mine deserve to have the care their children require. Children deserve parents who are not suffering from caregiver burnout 
and chronic sleep deprivation. Families deserve to be at home together. Home care nurses should be valued as high as hospital nurses, and their wages should reflect that. This increase of 55% will dramatically improve the ability of organizations like PHS to recruit and retain the nurses our children need and deserve. I'm respectfully asking that you approve SF 1830HF2087 to support the safety of our most vulnerable population and the Minnesota economy. Thank you for allowing me to share this with you today. And thank you for sharing. And if you wouldn't have said it, we wouldn't have known you were the least bit nervous. So thanks. We're just a bunch of people up here. <laughs> okay. And she thanks. ran she so, ran IEP meetings and she lived in the law of 94142, Senator Abler. <laughs> so, you know, that's like speaking my language. And it's, she said she, you wouldn't have even noticed it, you know. No. We could have a manifestation hearing right here. Right I mean, now I did run him. those meetings, but so. not today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You did a good Thank job. You. Thank you. Thank you. Stick listening. around a little bit. And yeah. so, Miss uh, Miss Stanfield, welcome to the committee. And hello, Gilbert. Gil <laughs> Gilbert's getting ready for a nap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> time time to listen to mom talk it means it puts him to sleep. Um, good afternoon. My name is Anna Stanfield, um, and this is my son, Gilbert. Though the current home health nurse shortage is a complex and multifaceted issue with several implications that have already been touched on for nurses, patients, and families, I'm here today to focus on how it impacts Gilbert's access to education. We live in Rochester and are within walking distance to Mayo Clinic St. Mary's Hospital. And while it's fantastic to have world-class medical care just down the street, it makes it challenging to find nurses in the home health field because pay at a hospital or clinic is so much more and much more reasonable for the skill set these nurses possess too. In fact, when Gilbert was hospitalized and we were seeking out home nursing to have him discharged, a social worker asked where we lived. When we told her, her response was, good luck, it's nearly impossible to find nursing this close to Mayo. He ultimately discharged without home nursing and myself, my husband, my mother, and close friends take shifts providing the 24 seven eyes on care that he needs. So what does this have to do with education? Well, Gilbert was supposed to start preschool this last fall, but that was put on hold. We have since learned that he will not be able to go to school in person until we are able to find a nurse to attend school with him. Without first finding a nurse or nurses who can provide the consistency needed to maintain Gilbert's school schedule, he has no choice but to partake in home-based learning. Mm -hmm. And though it's wonderful that this option even exists, it's still a subpar service compared to what's offered in a classroom setting. Disabled students in a home-based learning program do not receive vital supports such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech, vision, hearing, assistive technology, and so much more directly. An early childhood special education teacher is given information by all these different parties and is left to somehow provide a student with each of these services, often during a short instructional window of about 30 minutes once or twice a week. This is not adequate to um, get these services to these students. It's also unrealistic and places an enormous burden on already overworked and underfunded educators and their students. So while the issue of adequate pay for home health nurses is one with far reaching consequences for many, it's also important to remember that it's one of access and a child's right to a free and appropriate education. Though Gilbert may be legally receiving what is deemed appropriate by previous lawmakers, this committee has the power to make sure that his education and that of his peers is one that is truly appropriate and fosters opportunities for learning, friendships, and fun. I cannot leave today with also, without also mentioning the enormous privilege Gilbert and myself hold and that we are financially supported to the point that I am able to stay home and provide him the care that he needs. This is not the case for many families, especially those who are people of color or belong to other marginalized populations. Thank you for your time and I hope to hear that this bill is passed soon. And so what I, I'd like to hear that too, so. Yeah. Um, so that's the testifiers, I think. Uh, questions from members? Oh, Senator Mayquaid. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I just want to thank you for coming and sharing your stories of your children. Um, 
And I, I sit on the education committee, and as you were beginning your testimony, I was like, well, this doesn't sound like the least restrictive environment possible. That can't be legal. I want to haul this in front of the education committee and be like, <laughs> got to get some nurses. I, I'm really, yeah, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Senator Mr. Hoffman. Chair. Can I just interject? I, I haven't chair, heard, I love want. that. LRE, we're talking least restrictive environment. <laughs> Maximum extent appropriate. All students with disabilities shall be educated with their peers. I mean, that's just, you just quoted federal law. This is inconsistent with federal law. Thank you for bringing that up. Happens all Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm really, you know, we're talking hospital level skills, right? So these nurses, they they could go into a hospital, do it. They come to your home. It's the same care. Why is the pay not allowed to be the same as a hospital? I'm like, how and why? It's, sometimes you hear about problems and you're like, this is terrible. Why is it so? Well, the why is that's kind of how we set the rates, but. Um, if you wanted some the, one of the panel members or someone else could come up and answer the question. Cameo. I say you might be the one to answer this. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Ms. Zender. Senator May Quaid. That's um, Cameo here. I'll okay. Thank you. Yeah, get rid of Hoffman. That's good. <laughs> Ms. Zender, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, Senator Quaid, a very good question. Our, our ability to pay nurses is limited on the re reimbursement that we receive from the state, and we pass through as much as we possibly can so that we can pay a wage. It is not competitive with the hospitals. Uh, I think it's also important to note, as you've heard from these families and you, as you heard from Dr. Moore, these are specifically trained nurses. If nurse A is out, that doesn't mean we put in nurse B. Each nurse is trained to each child, so there is a significant investment in the importance of education. Dr. Brooke Moore described the simulation lab. Pediatric Home Service is, uh, I think, the only home care agency in the country that has a high fidelity simulation lab. We invested about $350,000 in that so that we had means to provide training to nurses in a safe environment. So when somebody like Gilbert decides to pull out his trach, that nurse has gained the confidence and competence to do that with a high fidelity mannequin rather than with a child. So um, the investment uh, won't bring us to a competitive wage with the hospital, but will allow us to uh, provide a, what is uh, closer to a fair compensation who nurses who are cho for nurses who are choosing to practice in the home. Senator McQuaid. Mr. Chair, thank you. And um, to be really clear, I, I mean, I was asking Senator Hoffman because so often these things are our fault. And I always want to know, why did we do that? And how can we not do that? So, um, you know, I would, I, I am obviously very supportive of this bill. I would love to hear the bill that gets us competitive with those hospitals so that it is not a revolving door, but it is which kind of care would I like to provide, not, mm -hmm. you know, do I, I only can go here because that's how much money I need to make to support my family. Because this is, this is just vital, critical work. And Y'all need to sleep and eat and shower sometimes, I assume. I have a 10-month-old. I do that occasionally, but not that often. And so um, that's, I want to hear that bill, too, the yeah, one that gets This is rare. I did shower today. I didn't. I make up, so. I'm going on day seven. <laughs> wow. Not lying. I'm sorry. I'm losing control here. Uh, <laughs> anybody else want to share any personal uh, bodily things? Uh, <laughs> so um, in Senator May Quaid, um, you were across the street, so you're in the, in the body who has just been pushing for this so mm -hmm. long, and, and so we're doing all we can. Um, and so with, with this hearing and, you know, as, uh, with the music thing, you know, and just to help people understand the beauty of Gilbert and Claire and... And the, the, and, oh, and Carter, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, and, but the parents that put their lives on entire hold and self-sacrifice to such an extent, it just makes me want to weep. And, and I'm so impressed. Uh, other comments from members? Um, Senator Hoffman, what else do you want to do? I just want to ask you a question, if I can. Um, and not that we want to go very far into the education side, but the committee did meet, and there is still the essence of the education committee from the last hearing that was just here before this meeting. Um, I was in the hallway uh, during session and told about a certain uh, district that refused to provide nursing care on site um, because they just didn't really want to. Um, yep. and, and so, uh, and this story here about Gilbert, um, and so we can't solve that here, but Senator Hoffman, I know you're quite the expert on this, and can you tell me how on earth you think that's okay? Sure, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair and members, that there are many districts that don't allow uh, private nurses to um, 
go to the school, right? It's, it's truly an acceptable thing under IDEA. And if you look at all the provisions of that, and, and we look at Gilbert, for example, is a preschool student. So the way the district is looking at the supports is going to be probably a homebound instruction, which by statute, it's one hour per unit per day. So when you look at he's a half FTE, not a full FTE. I mean, that's how this district, that's how the districts do it, right? So they, so the two and a half hours, it, you know, it's surprisingly, it shouldn't be that way, but it is, right? But there's also another provision in there that says in, in Tatro versus Texas, this, and sorry, but you asked the question and you want me to go there, I'll go there. So Tatro versus Texas, you cannot deny free appropriate public education, which is a constitutional civil right that is designed. It's also, it's an entitlement, right? It is an entitlement that, that needs to be put in place, but you can't deny access to education based upon uh, your, your medical needs, right? And then the, the other thing that it brings up, and I was just talking to uh, Tiffany on this one, right? Um, it's a violation of FAPE. You have a due process issue that goes into play. You know, when you look at what education's about, and I'm so glad uh, Senator May Quaid sits on the education committee because you have to look at the unique and individualized needs of the child and their disability and how it affects their education. That counters that whole due process conversation. That's where FAPE is issued at, at that moment in time. And so I, I think that they integrate well in this, and, and we have a bill, I think there's members of this committee that are on that bill that, that, that highlights getting private nurses to be able to be in the school district. Some school districts, and, and you know, somebody who lived this, a lived experience in a school district will tell you that um, it's not that easy, and it should be done and can be done. I know on one hand where some do it and some don't, and the reasons they don't are just beyond me, because it doesn't, here's the thing, when you go away from what's the FAPE, the due process right of Gilbert, because that's where it should be focused on, then there should never be a debate about what his needs are because it's going to be focused on his unique and individualized needs. Does that make sense, Mr. Chair? That was awesome. Thank you. Um, and I have one more, just a comment as this goes forward, and I'm not going to ask DHS to come down. I'm not even sure if the right people are here. But Senator Hoffman, um, in the fee-for-service world, which... I don't think we have in this committee, we have elderly disabled basic. I don't know what that even consists of with this bit. Um, and I don't think this is it. Yeah. But if they're paying fee for service in a hospital of $6,000 a day because they're delayed, and if we could raise the, money, raise the wages and get people out, there should be an offsetting cost savings. And so I'm just giving you that advice and the advice of your staff and our fiscal people to write that down and say, why the heck is a fiscal note not include a savings on the fee for service side? If it's a capitated HMO thing, then they pay and it's whatever, and, the, and Blue Cross gets to keep the money, and they need it apparently. Um, they don't. But, wow. Um, but so on the fee for service, there should be a savings. So, do you, do you, Senator Abler, Mr. Chair, is that um, you're hitting on something that really is? I've heard you say for many, many years about, you know, can you can your fiscal note should not should include those savings, right? And how will you account for that? And fee for yeah. service in this case should be doing that. And but so it's a direct one. It's, it's, a, it's like if I don't yes. if, I, if they leave, then the money is it's it's like not a second iteration away. So well, that's something you can take up with the commission. I, I would. I I don't think is it something uh, is the department ready to not come for down now, here? No, not for now. We have, right, have things so. to do. Uh, you um, hit it. So I don't know what the disposition of our bill is, Senator Abel. Well, it's going to be laid over for the moment, and we're going to try to make it law. All right. So. So Senator Hoffman, do you want to do the last word? Uh, I just thank you, everybody, for hearing this. This is real life. These are, these are real life lived situations, real stories, and they are integrated. Thank you, Senator Quay, for pointing out the education side of it. They, they all got to be integrated, and, and I, I appreciate everybody hearing this, and thank you for, for telling your story. So before yeah. I lay your bill over, I just want to tell the public who's watching, uh, if you watch much politics, it would make enough to make you ill. Um, look at the politics here on this committee. There is none. None. Look at the caliber of your chairman and his commitment to this cause. Be impressed. Pray for him. Thank you. The bill's laid over. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you. So, Senate File 73, we moved our, our little thingy around, so there, I was just informed that when we get to amendments, that there's an amendment to an amendment, so I'm Senator Quay, you're going to have to make sure I don't mess up the amendment to the amendment to the amendment. Senator Rasmussen, make sure I'm looking down at you, and if you're smiling, that means I got it right. So when I get to that point, will somebody remind me there's an amendment to the amendment? There's a song. Didn't John Croman do in a song, there's an amendment at the desk or something? Was there somebody? Huh? Wasn't there? Yeah, I got that. So um, Senator Port is not with us, but Senator Claire Verbetten is here, correct? Umar Verbeten. And it looks like we have, um, and, 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 and thanks for coming here, uh, Senator. I, I do uh, appreciate you sitting in for Senator Port. I know there's been lots of conversation, and somebody asked me, well, why is it going to human services? And there's a, there's a couple of things I want us to focus on, right? Um, when, when we look at the Anything with substance use, substance, mental health, substance in that kind of world, uh, anything that has to deal with human services, state-operated services kind of stuff, it would have some kind of a moment in time there. And so um, that's why it's there. Specifically, there's going to be, uh, we'll have some conversation about medical um, cannabis, and for example, I just had a bill this morning in Senator Wicklin's committee that um, helps our tribal uh, brothers and sisters uh, with uh, medical cannabis and realize that if Senate File 73 were to pass today as it's written, it would have nullified half that bill. So uh, I need to put a provision in that will um, safeguard our, our tribal uh, partners in Minnesota. And so uh, that'll be coming as long as well in this. So, and then also, Senator, we, we will have a, one on the public health uh, side of it as well, too. And I think that's all stuff that has been previously worked out. Um, and then I know there was another one that was heard in Senator Wicklin's committee and um, Senator Port and Senator Green are talking with some tribal elders about getting some clarification on that. I know Senator Utke um, had that language and there's two different variations on that, but Senator Utke is going to go back because um, Senator Port has acknowledged that if Senator Green um, gets conversation with some of the elders, um, uh, the tribal folks that got a hold of Senator Port, then, then, um, then they could work out the details and take it to the next stop. That is very clear. And I think Senator Utke, I got that clear and it's on that. We had the two different amendments. Now we're not going to touch those, right? So um, let's see. I think that's it. So welcome to the committee. Tell us who you are and what brings you here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm excited to be here in the Human Services Committee uh, presenting this bill. And I appreciate you grounding us in the amendments that we're um, going to see today and just that we want to keep the focus on human services jurisdiction. I, um, just in this opening statement, want to give some brief background on the bill, um, just tell you a little bit about why I'm supporting it, why it's important to me and where I'm coming from as a co-author, and then I'll highlight some of the things in uh, human services jurisdiction. So about the bill, um, this allows adults to safely and responsibly use cannabis. It creates a regulated marketplace that's much safer than our current underground illicit marketplace. It automatically expunges petty misdemeanor and misdemeanor cannabis convictions and establishes a cannabis expungement board to review higher charges like felonies for expungement or uh, resentencing. It sets up grants, loans, and technical assistance for small businesses and individuals who wish to enter the cannabis industry. And it provides funding for public health awareness, youth access prevention, and substance abuse addiction and treatment, including treatment courts. 
Uh, so why this is important to me um, is really understanding that the cannabis prohibition has caused immense harm in our communities, and that's particularly when it comes to the criminal justice system. Black Minnesotans and white Minnesotans consume cannabis at very similar rates, yet black Minnesotans are five times more likely to be arrested for possessing cannabis. And the expungement that we see in this bill is really important to me, you know, if we're going to go forward with legalizing cannabis, we really have a responsibility to clear those records. The other thing that I think is absolutely necessary is that the benefits of legalizing cannabis are going towards those who are most harmed by cannabis prohibition um, and ensuring that they get to participate in this new regulated market. The bill really lays out the ways we will give those folks preference. Um, so for me, the bill's about repairing harm, um, righting those wrongs, and really addressing the racial injustice. A few things I want to highlight um, because we're here in the Human Services Committee is um, that this bill includes uh, substance use disorder expertise requiring that in our cannabis advisory board. So that will uh, need to include an expert in the prevention and treatment of substance use disorders and a patient with ex uh, experience in the mental health system or substance use disorder treatment system. There's also some substance use disorder treatment and prevention grants. Um, I mentioned earlier education on cannabis use and substance use. So uh, the commissioner of uh, MDE has to, in consultation with the commissioners of Health and Human Services and some other experts, um, develop or find a model program that can be used to educate, especially our middle and high school students, um, on cannabis use and substance use. There's a um, study on mental health and substance use disorder systems. So that Office of Cannabis Management is required to conduct a study on the state's mental health system, substance use disorder treatment system uh, to determine the rates at which individuals access those systems, and then reports due to the legislature. Uh, there's more information on home visiting programs, county social services. Happy to go into any of those in more detail, but a lot included in this bill. Um, I do want to give time for our testifiers to come up, and I'm just really looking forward to having the conversation in the committee today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Any questions for the good Senator from Falcon Heights? No? Seeing none? Uh, let's start with um, the folks that are on Zoomerang. Uh, it looks like we have David Benson, I'm not even going to pronounce your last name correctly, so David Benson Stobler, if I said that right, please acknowledge, if not, uh, go ahead and correct me. And then Glenn McElfrish. So there are the two people I think. Uh, and Marie, oh, I see Maria Poirier. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. I'm just absolutely. Here we go. It's like Monday all over again. What's that movie, Senator? You know that movie where they uh, Groundhog Day? Isn't it? This is like Groundhog Day to me. Jeez. All right. So uh, uh, David Benson Stabler, welcome to uh, the committee. McElfrish. So oh, hold on. I, I can't hear you very well. Uh, Marie, oh, I see Maria Poirier. Oh, I'm Poirier. Sorry, I'm just absolutely here to go. It's like Monday, Oliver. Again. What's that movie, Senator? You know that movie where they... Oh, wow. Uh, that's, look at that. So, David Benson, Stan Stopler, welcome to... Uh, uh, Great. So, you guys just get to hear me mess up twice. I mean, that's... Just... Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. I Go I'm ahead. It's all yours. On here? Okay. David Benson Stabler. Uh, so you maybe remember Kenny Stabler, quarterback, different spelling, same name, or Detective Elliot Stabler, SVU. Anyway. Um, That's funny. That was good. Thank you. I'm a lobbyist for SAVE, which is a C4 nonprofit. Thank you very much, Senator. Do we have a loop on? Sorry. It's all yours. On here? Stable. Mine is looping. I don't know why that is. Let me shut mine up. Okay, sorry. There was a delay there. I'm just going to... Um, <laughs> sorry about that. I also a registered lobbyist for ANC, the Anti-Addictive Drug and Anti-Narcotic Coalition. Um, speaking to you today about a primary factor in determining the cost expectations of this bill. Uh, so costs to result from recreational cannabis legalization, um, however termed, should take into consideration how much is usage going to increase. 
Now, this bill contemplates the possibility that there'll be no usage in increases and no increases in services, but this is, is preposterous. It's one word you can use for it. Um, and there's irrefutable hard data. And we're gonna look at uh, Colorado quickly here, just as, as an example, we've got this up on our uh, website. Colorado shows irrefutable use, whatever you get from surveys, um, asking people, I think with marijuana in particular, surveys might not be the best source of information, but not to get too, too much into that. I know I have very limited time here, but um, usage in California is up 400%, clear stat. Okay, $1.4 billion, $5.3 billion, okay, since legalization. Usage of THC concentrates is roughly doubled. The marijuana industry calls this maturing users. They need to use more and they use higher concentrated products, which costs less per dollar. So in that dollar figure, you've got four to 25 times more THC being consumed by the user per revenue dollar. Okay, so we've got this huge increase. California's population has decreased during this period of time. You've got legal sales in California, according to NPR, that are a mere 10 to 20% of the market at the end. Um, do tell me when I'm out of time. I don't want to go over. Um, in any case, that leaves maybe, you know, nine tenths or four fifths of the pie, but you have a pie, which is by the revenue figure, four times larger. And by the THC quantity, clearly more like seven or eight. So you can say at least five times more THC being used in California as a result of legalization. So clearly addictions are gonna go even at a higher proportion um, increase and all of the services are going to increase. So there needs to be a very serious discussion and consideration of the cost increases and not this stuff about the same people are gonna use regardless. Accessibility, availability, social normalization, which is a, more, a bigger objective of the educational programs that are being discussed and that are in the bill than telling kids not to use. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Stabler. I said that right, and I appreciate that. So I... Uh... Thank you very much. Next, uh, we're going to go to Maria Poirier. Again, I'm going to get that wrong. Doctor, you're up Kenny next. Stabler, Thank you. Different spelling, same name, or? Yes, hello. Um, can you hear me, folks? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes. Hello, I'm Maria Poirier. I'm an internal medicine physician from Rochester. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. I'm concerned that legalizing recreational cannabis will increase healthcare costs and put an additional strain on Minnesota's caregiver workforce at hospitals, nursing home, and memory care units. Australian researchers found that middle-aged cannabis users with at least weekly cannabis use showed a mean five-point decline in IQ compared to their childhood IQ. Researchers are uncertain if cannabis users show elevated rates of dementia in later life. Minnesota already has a caregiver crisis I'm concerned that legalizing an addictive substance that causes confusion and is associated with cognitive decline and possibly dementia will overwhelm the long-term care industry. Falls cause significant morbidity in seniors who often end up in nursing homes for rehabilitation. Older chronic cannabis users have a greater likelihood of falling compared to older non-users. Cannabis use causes sudden changes in blood pressure and heart rate, thereby increasing the risk of fainting and falling particularly in seniors who often take multiple medications. The cannabis bill does not allocate money for prevention or treatment of cannabis related falls. Legalization of recreational cannabis will also increase healthcare costs. A Stanford study presented at a national cardiology conference this week found that people who use marijuana daily are 34% more likely to develop coronary artery disease compared to never users, independent of tobacco or alcohol use. Cannabis use also increases the risk of developing atrial fibrillation, a heart rhythm that can cause stroke. The cannabis deal, bill does not allocate money for prevention and treatment of cannabis-related cardiovascular disease. Many people have a false belief that if cannabis is legal, then it must be safe. Unfortunately, last week, two adults were poisoned with cannabis edibles laced with fentanyl, which they purchased legally at a smoke shop in Pennsylvania. Since, can, uh, since state legalized cannabis isn't regulated by the FDA, manufacturers do not have to prove through human clinical trials that their products are safe, effective, 
or whether they will interact with prescription medications or other health conditions. There is also no national registry for reporting cannabis-related adverse events. Unfortunately, Minnesota's adult age group saw a record increase in hospital-treated cannabis poisonings following the legalization of THC edibles on July 1st. Minnesota has a caregiver crisis. We don't have the resources to care for those who will suffer from cannabis-related adverse events if recreational cannabis is legalized. I urge you to vote no. Um, please see my written testimony for references. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Um, next we have Glenn McElfrish. Thank, thank you, Chair Hoffman. Uh, uh, nice work on my name, thank you. Uh, Chair Hoffman, committee members, and Senator Umu Verbaten, thank you for allowing me to speak today on SF73. My name is Glenn McElfresh, and I'm a co-founder of Plif, a hemp-derived beverage company. A few days ago, Governor Ventura spoke about the high prices of Minnesota's medical marijuana program, and at least 58% of medical marijuana patients agree with the governor. In the most recent patient satisfaction survey, 58% of patients said they disagreed or strongly disagreed with the statement they could afford to buy the medical marijuana they need to treat their symptoms. Yet SF-73 will almost certainly lead to increased medical marijuana prices. Illinois' 21 medical marijuana cultivators had nearly 15 times as much canopy as Minnesota's two medical marijuana manufacturers. Yet Illinois patients complained about increased prices and lack of product selection when adult use marijuana launched. If Illinois is any indication of Minnesota's future, and I believe it is, medical marijuana prices will increase and product selection will decrease in spite of the medical marijuana manufacturer's best efforts otherwise. There's simply not enough plants in the ground to serve the adult use and medical marijuana markets and access to medical marijuana will move further out of reach for lower and middle income Minnesota. We've heard previous expert testimony that Minnesota's adult use market would require an additional 600,000 square feet of indoor canopy to meet recreational marijuana demand. I do not know if that number, I apologize for that. I do not know if that number uh, is entirely up to date, uh, but Minnesota's two medical marijuana manufacturers have approximately 250,000. Jay Giles banned. Wait, you had, uh, you had a Jay Giles banned freeze frame. Medical. Why don't you go back and oh, restate no. your thing? I'm sorry, sir. Uh, do you know when I froze? Um, but. $250 something, and then Jay Giles okay, came about into this? play. So. I, uh, based on the publicly available data, which I, know, which I know may not be entirely up to date, Minnesota's two medical marijuana manufacturers have approximately 250,000 square feet of canopy between their two cultivations to serve an estimated 600,000 square feet of demand. As we've heard from patient testimony, the two medical marijuana manufacturers are doing all they can to serve more than 40,000 medical marijuana patients but our patients are still hurting. Uh, the two medical, manu medical marijuana manufacturers should be applauded for operating under these conditions, but forcing them to serve the entire adult use market for an unknown period of time is concerning. We need more accurate canopy estimates to better serve Minnesota's medical and adult use marijuana markets. Legalizing marijuana and beginning to repair the harm caused by the war on drugs is the right thing to do. I and Plif both support adult use marijuana legalization. Please consider how we can achieve these goals without making life harder for Minnesota businesses, consumers, and medical marijuana patients. Mr. Chair, members, and Senator Umu Verbaten, thank you once again for the opportunity to testify uh, today, and I apologize for the technical difficulties and background noise, but thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, McElfresh. I, I appreciate that. And uh, anytime I can quote a band from the 70s and 80s, I, I'm, I'm happy. So, Senator Umu Verbaten, um, you have a couple of more folks. We have uh, Heather and Randy Bacchus, Joan Barron, and Kat Franklin up to testify that coming up. So if you want to. And then I think Kayla Fearing from Healing Fear Consulting is also. Is that correct? All right. Thank you. Um, Heather and Randy Bacchus, welcome. You guys can just slide the chair over next to each other if you want. Or, um. Welcome to Human Services. Thank you. 
Mr. Chair, Senator Hoffman, and members of the Human Services Committee, thank you for allowing us to submit written testimony in opposition to SF-73. I'm Heather Backus, this is my husband Randy, and we'll testify together in two different chunks. We're the parents of a forever 21-year-old son who died because of cannabis-induced psychosis and suicide in July of 2021. We're here on behalf of all families and those struggling with addiction and mental health that are fearful to come forward because Minnesotans deserve better. Our son is dead, so it's too late for us. Unlike many in this room, we have no financial interest, but we desperately want to prevent others from experiencing this tragedy. Our son Randy started using cannabis at the age of 15. It was readily available. At 16, he was diagnosed with a severe cannabis use disorder and went to wilderness therapy. At 18, he moved to Colorado, a legal use state. He believed it was beneficial. He used flowers, vapes, edibles, and it caused anxiety, depression, grandiosity, paranoia, and delusions. In March of 2021, he went into full-blown psychosis. In April of 2021, he was suicidal and admitted for a three-day hold in the psychiatric hospital. Although he marked each of the five boxes on his intake that he was suicidal, he had a plan to take his life and he had the means to complete it. After 24 hours, he was released due to a shortage of beds. Three months later, he completed suicide. Cannabis caused that. Keep in mind this happened in a legal use state that supposedly had guardrails. He was never assigned a case manager, never a social worker, never offered a plan for treatment or advised how to pay for his medical bills and they were roughly $22,000. He never got the human services he needed. Cannabis has been legal there for years. Can the state of Minnesota do better? This is from the Minnesota Department of Human Services uh, website that I looked up last night. These are your numbers. One in 25 will have serious mental illness, such as schizophrenia or bipolar. One in 10 will have experienced a major period of depression. And people with mental illness have 10 to 25 years shorter lifespan. These numbers will get bigger. And loudly enough, on the second page, it says that most areas of the state do not have the range of services needed to meet the need. As a result, people travel long distances or receive inappropriate level of care. That's what's on your Minnesota Department of Human Services website. How is it going to be better when you legalize marijuana, which will increase the need for mental health services be damaging to those under 25? Please require toxicology reports on all suicides, toxicology and when kids go or people go in for emergency department services or when they hit the psychiatric hospital. We need to regulate and see where what's happening because it will increase. I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Randy Backus. <clears throat> kind of as our journey has gone through here, I found that many of our senators and representatives do not know about today's marijuana or cannabis. Today's cannabis is no longer natural. It's no longer God-made. It's an engineered and genetically cultivated product. Cannabis flower contains, on average, 25% THC. That's a five to seven-fold increase from when I was in school in the 80s. The extracts that are pulled from the cannabis plant that result in the high-potency product are referred to as concentrates. These concentrates can be put in anything from vapes to oils to gummies and chocolates, 60 to 90% THC. Then there's such things as dabs. Dabs are small blobs of cannabis extracts with names like wax, shatter, batter, honey, and many other cute names. One serving of a dab is equal to four to five joints, which is, results in an off the chart high. It's scientifically proven that high potency THC damages the developing brain, it causes psychosis, Su can lead to suicidal ideation, anxiety, and depression in adolescents and young adults. We already have medical cannabis, and what's interesting is listening to all this testimony, we have this medical cannabis that right now some people are not able to get access to. Bottom line, when we're looking at that, expand the program, make the program better for the medical cannabis. Legalizing it is not gonna make it better. Legalizing it's gonna put the fact that you guys believe that this is safe. Um, if we look at the social justice as this catalyst for this legislation and the fact that one and a half ounces of cannabis is, is already decriminalized, then why haven't legislators already proposed and expunged these records of people that in the past had this? It should have already been done. 
Fact of the matter is this is not about social justice. It's about big business, money, and influence. If anything, the social justice will become a social injustice, truly hurting those communities it's supposedly trying to help. So here we are trying to slam this bill through without age restrictions, potency caps, or the necessary human services and support that is needed. You're going to leave these guardrails up to a cannabis management board and make it up as they go along. Uh, please educate yourself with sources other than those that, that the industry is currently sharing with you. You are taking a position that legalization equals safe and that this is the best that we can do for Minnesota. We tell our youth to be bold, courageous, and yet as adults, leaders and representatives, we lack the strength to do what's right. We can do better, Minnesotans deserve better. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Heather and Randy. Um, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. <clears throat> Joan Barron. And uh, Kat Franklin, you might as well come on down and get in the warm-up deck to the left. Did I get your name right? Joan Barron, yes. Yes, all right. I'm one for one after five minutes. Welcome to the committee, Joan. Good afternoon, Senator Hoffman, Chairman Hoffman, committee members. My name is Joan Barron, and I'm here in today in support of Senate File 73. I have currently been enrolled in our state's medical program since roughly 2015. I am now completely opiate-free. I damaged and entrapped the main motor and sensory nerve of the pelvis, the pedental nerve, in 2001. I was 39 years old. In July, I turned 60. At that time, our teenage son, Adam, had been struggling with social anxiety and depression and soon after my fall began medicating with my doctor prescribed meds while I was traveling to Mayo, France, and San Francisco for surgery and specialized PT. He then went on to use heroin. He died in 2014 in our family room at the age of 29 from the same drug that got him addicted, my methadone. As soon as those drugs entered our home, we didn't have a chance. I'm incredibly lucky to be here. I can't believe I made it through all those years. I've lost fellow pain warriors to suicide overdoses. They have either completely lost their minds and their marriages. I literally have chunks of time I don't remember. Adam wasn't as lucky. Rule 25 in this state was a nightmare. We were, also, we were so desperate at one point, we sent him to Florida for rehab, only to have him sex traffic it out for three months. We had no idea where he was. They never came and picked him up at the airport. He contracted hepatitis C. He had violent seizures. He had calluses and scars on both his arms and at too many overdoses to count. I watched him detox multiple times, shaking violently, sweating, begging me to help make it stop. The for-profit treatment pro system that Minnesota has in place for treating addicts failed us at every turn. From the lack of choices that we could afford to the stigma even within the treatment community that puts added pressure on those still in deep addiction but who have also relapsed repeatedly. He tried so hard but he felt totally defeated and humiliated. I know what it feels like to be physically dependent on a drug. Opiates literally rewire a person's brain. The way I perceive pain is not like someone who hasn't, who's taken opiates for almost 20 years. Taking opiates negatively affected my relationships with family and friends. I'm now a better wife, a better mother to my daughter, and a better grandparent and friend. I'm better able to cope with 24-7 pelvic pain because of cannabis. Cannabis is not heroin. I don't care what the federal government says. I don't care how it's classified. By now, we should all know why it became illegal, and it has nothing to do with the, with the safety or health concerns of the plant. Cannabis is not the same as heroin. I take great offense to anyone's claiming that it is. Should some people not use cannabis, high THC cannabis? Yeah, there's probably many. But the same way that some folks cannot drink whiskey, tequila, or Everclear, that doesn't mean we remove all the booze from the shelf. The vast majority of people who use cannabis do so responsibly, and they do it every single day in this state, regardless of the legality. People are using cannabis. The sky is not falling, nor will it. Kids need to be empowered. They need reliable, factual information. I have three grandchildren, 19, 16, and 
12. They live in a small town north of the metro. The two older boys could get a bag of cannabis within five minutes. It's already here, it's just not legal. I wish I hadn't insisted on abstinence only with Adam. I didn't know enough about harm reduction at the time and our story cannot be rewritten. But others right now today should have a right, a legal right to choose a safer alternative. My son did not go from cannabis to heroin. His gateway drug was mental illness, depression, anxiety, and he was self-medicating with my meds. Try getting someone in active addiction, a mental health diagnosis. It's impossible, and that way of thinking is killing people. Our medical program has been a disaster. Minnesota veterans, many of them are still locked out, despite the discount. Our aging population deserves to be able to choose a safer alternative, and all chronic pain patients in Minnesota deserve a safer, affordable alternative. And most certainly, those battling heroin opiate addiction deserve the option of cannabis when traditional faith-based 12-step programs fail. And they do, the majority of the time. And that isn't talked near enough about. I fully support adult use cannabis legalization in Minnesota. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Thank you, Ms. Barron, for your testimony. Next up is Kat Franklin, and then um, Kayla Fearing, if I get that right, come on down after that. So, Kat, welcome to the committee. Thank you, thank you for having me. I'm Kat Franklin. I've been sober 21 years from addiction. I'm also a recovery coach for 15 years. I've also been working in the cannabis legal states for the last 10. First, I want to say sorry to Heather and Joan for your loss. It's not fair for a mother to ever have to put their child under before you. I firsthand saw my mom bury his own son due to alcoholism. I'm a victim or an addict, whether whatever you want to call it. I'm overly consumed market that's not frowned upon but encouraged. I've had, you have a bad work day, you have a cocktail. It's always five o'clock somewhere. Alcohol is legal. Being one that cannot control my use of alcohol, I have now chose not to take a drink. I can play both sides. I can truly see from all views, but I still truly believe that this plant can do so much for us medically and economically with the growth of Minnesota. Being managed and regulated, we will take that responsibility and we won't see chemically induced marijuana. We won't see high amounts that come from a man-made this is a mother's nature plant. Bring in a new perspective to what they call the devil's lettuce. Personally, it's helped me with Lyme disease, PTSD, anxiety, muscle spasms, and chronic pain. I spoke briefly a few weeks back about why I'm here today, but I'm gonna also navigate in other areas on how cannabis can help in recovery and how I have seen firsthand as a recovery coach. Many feel that once you recover, you must become fully clean. That can be some case for all, but not everybody. Addiction recovery is not a one-size-fits-all, unless you want to live under a box and never walk outside your house again. Addiction is something that we all have to deal with at some point. I have seen firsthand the benefits of treatment with the use of cannabis, cannabinoids, CBD, once you become clean, and al clean with alcohol and drugs. It's a choice. It can also aid in the detox process. Not sure how many of you guys have actually gone through physical withdrawals from alcohol, heroin, etc. That is a physical addiction, not a mental addiction. I have shaken, I have had tremors, I've had seizures. I was hallucinating, nauseated, insomnia, you name it. I wasn't pretty. <laughs> but taking a look back, well, let's look at what cannabis can do. Cannabis helps with muscle spasms, tremors, seizures, nauseation, insomnia. It's an appetite stimulant. It sounds like an excellent combating agent for the things that I went through above all by myself 21 years ago. Most European countries in Canada embrace the idea of harm reduction. Design policies have helped people with drug problems to live a better, healthier life than rather punishing them and going abstinent. On the front lines of addiction in the United States, some addiction specialists are also beginning to work with this goal. John, which is a program director and founder of High Sobriety out of California, says his Los Angeles-based treatment center uses cannabis as a detox and maintenance protocol for people with more severe addictions. However, its effectiveness is not scientifically proven, but the reason for that is because it, we don't have enough time. We can't lump this plant to the same level as fentanyl. 
But if we reach out and speak to others that use harm reduction method, we can start collecting the data and actually see how it has helped. Like I said in recovery, in recovery, we call this harm reduction theory. With cannabis, there is no lethal dose from cannabis itself. It can be helpful in many certain conditions. Some say that could be hype. I'm being hypocritical, but you know you're supposed to go into rehab and get off drugs. Some patients want to gradually move into absence, weaning themselves off drugs, but some patients want to move into a, a happy form of sobriety from a drug and using a less harsher drug, something that can be regulated, mm -hmm. monitored, and controlled. Replacing benzos for anxiety and PTSD with an unaltered regulated cannabis can benefit many. We have seen and heard over and over with patients with PTSD. In theory, we humans, we need to moderate, and it's not an all-in-one concept. We see kids playing video games. We have Amazon shopping. We have brown boxes at our door, and we know that 90% of those boxes we don't need. That is a human nature thing. That is not a cannabis fault. Sadly, addiction can already become the blueprint of us. I inherited genes that caused me not to be able to pick up another drink. But physical addiction is second step to mental addiction. There is a slope that nobody wants. Sadly, it happens to many people. A phys physical addiction is caused by alcohol, benzos, opioids, heroin. It's a twofold mental and physical addiction. At this day and stage, we do not know that there is anything with cannabis related. If you need something for anxiety, PTSD, and pain management, after you get sober, what are you supposed to turn to? Cannabis is a, not a gateway drug. It is a coined term. A gateway drug is something that is not medically termed, but coined. I can't tell you how many people of my patients that have left rehab and become addicted to something else like sex, shopping, gambling. Restraint and self-control needs to be taught at the addiction centers. Not legalizing cannabis isn't going to control the addiction issues we have. It, what's going to actually happen is we're going to legalize cannabis and we're going to realize that's not part of it. Cannabis can help. Cannabis can be used in moderation. By everybody? No. By some? Yes. Regulating and maintaining a good legal system to use cannabis will also help this. We can't control the streets, but we can maintain quality and safety once it's legal. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Franklin. Um, Kayla Fearing from Healing Fear Consulting. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Senate Human Services Committee. My name is Kayla Fearing, and I am a small business owner of Healing Fear Consulting, which specializes in healthcare science-based cannabinoid education. I've been a healthcare worker since I was 18 years old, so about 15 years. I am also a Michigan medical cannabis patient due to not qualifying for our own Minnesota cannabis program. The last three years, I have worked out in Michigan and the Illinois cannabis markets. I've learned a lot from my medical career in the Midwest, but most importantly, I've learned that cannabinoids do have a place in all medical realms, and it needs to be incorporated in medicine, in practices, and with professionals. It is a disservice to our human service professionals and programs to act like cannabis is the devil's lettuce. Cannabis is a therapeutic plant. Cannabis and cannabinoid products should be treated like any other over-the-counter, especially in a recreational and a medical market. If one has allergies, Benadryl is always recommended first. People abuse and become addicted to Benadryl. Same for Robitussin, but both Benadryl and Robitussin are recommended before seeing an allergy or an ENT specialist in the medical world. To continue to treat cannabis in healthcare and human service industries in any other way is ignorant. Our own Minnesota Medical Assistance Program, which I have grown up on and been part of as an adult, offers 30 days of opioids to patients like myself for a single dollar. That same amount of medication for me, a gram of cannabis concentrate a day, would be $100, over $100 at one of our dispensaries. While we as healthcare workers and human service departments keep, are, are expected to keep discouraging cannabis use, that is ignorant. My best friend of 20 years, Chad, actually died of an accidental fentanyl overdose last April 5th, 2022. He was one of three that opened Cadence Records and Coffee over on St. Paul's East Side. He was an artist and a father. He was encouraged by his program staff at Hazleton over his years of sobriety from heroin to continue pill use as he battled PTSD, but not cannabis use. Chad was only 32 years old when he overdosed and died. 
While working at cannabis shops in Michigan the last two years with medical and recreational licenses in those stores, we averaged 1,400 customers a day, and most of those purchases were recreational. This is due to patients choosing not to get a medical card, but patients in those 21 over choosing recreational cannabis as a medicine, private citizens and patients, they should have the right to seek the medicine of their choice, and Minnesotans should have that choice as well. If one works in healthcare or human services like myself, we've always been discouraged from cannabis. We should also have that right to exercise our right to our chosen medical medicine. I'm a chronic pain patient and I, like I've said already, I consume a, a gram of high potency medical cannabis concentrate almost daily. Every body is different and I ask Minnesota lawmakers and this committee to acknowledge that. Regardless, regardless if it's a medical cannabis card or to practice their right to buy over the counter, aka recreational cannabis, or to grow their own supply. I hope again that the Human, Human Services Committee can help end the stigma of THC and cannabinoids in healthcare. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla Fearing. Next up is uh, Ray Anna Buckholtz. Uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. My name is Rayanna Buckles, and I am the Legislative and Coalitions Director for Americans for Prosperity here in Minnesota. Um, I'm actually not going to use my time right now to address our support of this bill in a professional manner. I'm actually going to take this time to share a personal story. Um, I will reiterate that we do support them. Um, help, I'm very uh, happy to send additional information on those legislative measures that we do support. Um, but I just wanted to share, uh, when I was growing up, my mother unfortunately fell victim to an opioid addiction after she broke her neck in a near-death car accident. Um, and I remember those days like they were yesterday. And I remember as a child living on the edge, wondering who my mom might be that day. Um, whether it was going to be a good day or a bad day. And I remember one Christmas in particular, she'd been taken to jail because of an incident stemming from her addiction. And as a big sister, I felt like it was my duty to make sure that my little sister still had a Christmas. So I took items from around the house to give to her so that she wouldn't wonder why Santa didn't come to her that year. And I remember how angry and confused I was and how afraid I was, not only at the uncertainty of my future, but of my mom's future and my family's. Um, and no child should have to go to bed hoping that their mother doesn't wake up in the morning because of how terrifying she has become because of her addiction to opioids. And no child should have to hope that they don't wake up in the morning because they see no way out of the drowning chaos and hopelessness that addiction causes. Um, so with all of that said, uh, my experiences and those that I love and with their encouragement, I am here because I do support Senate File 73 and the legalization of cannabis. Cannabis has been an alternative for my mom to use in lieu of prescription medication and the pain that she feels from fibromyalgia is relieved and she's able to sleep and lead a good life and she's helping others who are also in recovery. And she's come a long way on her road of recovery and I'm so proud of her progress. Um, but everyone's experience is different and cannabis is not for everyone, but people deserve access to a product that isn't cut with who knows what from the street in a black market. People and individuals like my mom should be able to access cannabis in a safely regulated manner if they so choose. My heart truly goes out to every individual affected by addiction. Um, and I urge those of you who have not come forward to just hang in there and don't be afraid to share your story because that's the only way we can have these conversations and shed the taboo of these topics of addiction and share our stories. Um, and I call legislators to put people directly affected by and experience with substance abuse at the table to talk about what we can do to address the larger picture of addiction. And don't let this conversation stop when the bill conversation stops. Let's not just throw people in jail like my mom had been. Uh, we need to pursue real solutions that help those battling with substance abuse and ensure that resource, resources are available and we need to decriminalize addiction. Legalization will be a huge transformational measure in many ways and I want to thank the Senate authors for being so open and deliberate about the provisions that they have put within this bill. We still have a ways to go to continue and shape and improve this legislation, and I do encourage thoughtful and productive, productive conversations, and I look forward to continuing my support both in a professional and personal capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Buckholtz. Senator uh, Umu Verbaten. That ends the testimonies. Um, members, any 
questions, comments? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate all the testifiers for sharing their stories today on how uh, cannabis has impacted them and their families. Um, question for the bill author. I, I noticed, you know, in the bill, and I noticed that many committee stops, we still don't have a fiscal note, and was just wondering if we had any idea on the timing of when we might have a fiscal note. A lot of blank appropriations in here, um, and we'd just love to hear when we'll have that. Senator Umuver Baton, do you happen to have an answer to that? Because if not, I assume Senator Utke is probably going to ask the same question. So there we go. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Rasmussen. No, we don't have a fiscal note. Um, I know that our staff are working on it, but that's as much information as I have right now. Senator Rasmussen, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I do believe that that is an important piece, and I know this bill is making uh, a lot of committee stops, and I know Senator Port and the other authors have worked really hard on this bill, um, but in the fiscal note for the legalization bill that uh, was heard in the House last biennium, you know, we had some important details that were put in that fiscal note that actually related to uh, human services and public safety. Uh, one example uh, was the Department of Public Safety estimated that there would be an increase in traffic fatalities and serious uh, car accidents, and they requested more funding for crash reconstructionists uh, as a part of their work in uh, the Department of Public Safety. And I think for this committee, uh, you know, to adequately sign off on this bill, we need to be hearing from DHS and from others in terms of what impact they think this bill could have on uh, substance use disorder within the state of Minnesota. And so even though I know this bill is, is uh, the bill authors are working hard and it's making many committee stops, I feel like we don't have, frankly, the information to adequately even engage on this legislation without that fiscal note piece, especially, Mr. Chair, since one of the promised goals of some of the revenue raised uh, from potential taxes on this product will be going into, uh, you know, help uh, deal with some of the costs that will come from increased substance use disorder. Um, and I know this bill's racing, you know, to meet deadline, but, but frankly, I think this might be one of these bills that um, we should wait, take a look at, get the fiscal note, and take a serious look at next year um, given uh, you know the complexity that comes with this bill and everything that's going on in it. Yeah, thank you, Senator Rasmussen. And, and to that point, there's a um, there's there's a piece in there when we we wanted to make sure that uh, prevention, not just prevention, but prevention, treatment, and recovery. You got to use that three things in in the same breath because addiction is addiction is addiction. I don't care. I'm not going to get into the well. It's this. No, no. It's addiction is addiction is addiction. But having that bit of information. And I know that there's a conversation about how much do we set aside. I know Senator Abler, I, I don't know, we were doing, do you put a percentage aside? Do you do, I remember this conversation from last year and, and uh, or a dollar amount. And I, I don't know when, because you bring a good point, you know, because we, we had to wait. And we almost didn't have the last engrossment for the beginning of our hearing, right? I mean, we had all these amendments that we were talking about that we need to add to make this bill a better bill so it goes along the way, right? I mean, this is part of the reason why you get these stops. But I think one of the things we could sure um, have a point in is if those things aren't addressed um, that, that you just brought up, whether that public safety side of it and the addiction side of it, then um, I guess I would have no qualms about rule 21 ing or whatever it is the rule you need to bring it back here and and i think i can get 34 votes to do that so i think the author the the comment from this committee is if we're going to move this on we need to have an assurance from the authors of the house and the senate that they're going to make sure that you know um that fiscal note is is done appropriately and that you know that the concerns that we had and there's i'm going to bring up a whole bunch of other concerns i want you to share um because uh, I, I'm going to get to I'm going to segue to this point, if I can, Senator Rasmussen. Um, I raised the issue of addiction, and I got my life threatened from people, activists that are, that are following this, this field. You, you don't tell me you're going to drop a horse head in order to get my attention, because you just got my attention. Anybody want to look up the last name of my wife's morning show partner in radio and television, and you can be guaranteed that anytime you say that last name, and Senator Abler knows who I'm talking about, when you say, get to him by, because he's hanging out at Cub all the time, we see him in the public, send him a horse head, right? That's a direct threat. And, and, and I don't appreciate that, because what that causes me to do, and I'm not saying this to you, you know, Senator, but, but you're, the, you know, you're in front of there, but to this point, 
is if we're rushing something through and all of a sudden somebody's going to threaten, personally threaten, not just me, but when you say send him a horse head, that's meaning you're going to do something to my family, right? Not okay in my book. Matter of fact, thank God we have the state patrol that we can go ahead and, and, and open up and say, here's the story, right? The state patrol absolutely had that and they absolutely went in and they took a look and I'm so honored and, and, and proud of our state patrol because I didn't know where to go with that, right? But that's because it became personal. And to his point, you know, I'm not going to feel pressure to push something through unless some of those things that I have concerns on. And I'm going to give a whole list of them. And, and I could add, as, as the chair of this committee, we could go ahead and add a bunch of amendments, on, but I'm not going to do that. But to the point, please, that Senator Rasmussen is bringing up, please get that to us. And if not, then I think that bill needs to come back to us. But, and, I, and I just needed to share with you that, that point of personal preference, if I could, that I don't appreciate having my life threatened um, on social media uh, the way it was threatened. Um, and, and that's just to that point that this is, you know, after we just hear testimony of the bills that what we really want to work on in this committee is, is the the fact of our nursing services to kids with disabilities, the fact our nursing homes are closing their doors, our assisted living facilities are being shut down. We have people with co-occurring conditions that are homeless, right? They should be having wavered services. Those are the things that I personally want to work on, right? I don't want to work on whether or not someone's going to send me a horse head. So I, and, that, and again, this is not directed toward you, but you happen to be the one in front of me on that. But to that point, thanks for triggering me there. I really appreciate that, Senator Rasmussen. That was good. That was, that was well played. No, I'm kidding. That was just like, but to your point, I, I absolutely agree with you on that. Did you want to follow up on, on any of what I just said? So. No, thank you, Senator Hoffman. And I appreciate your commitment to wanting to get this right, because I think it's important for Minnesotans. It's going to affect... Um, you know, millions of Minnesotans and their lives and their families and will have historic consequence for the state. Uh, one of the broad concerns I have, and I just wanted to clarify this too, um, is actually on the low potency uh, licensure in this bill. And um, I, I think we could understand having licenses for individuals who are seeking out a cannabis product for whatever reason, whether that be recreational or medical, but they are going specifically to a retailer that's licensed for that specific purpose. But it's my understanding in the current bill before the committee that any grocery store, convenience store, uh, bar, restaurant could now be selling cannabis products. And my concern is, you know, we're, we're not only opening up uh, access to products um, to more Minnesotans, but we're actually putting these products in front of Minnesotans who are not seeking them out. And so my question, uh, Mr. Chair, for the bill author and the advocates is, you know, if this bill's passed, could we see pop brownies in grocery stores, pop brownies on the menu at, uh, you know, local burger joints? And I was wondering if you could talk about that piece. That's a, I didn't. That, it, thank you for that, Senator Esterson. Uh, Senator uh, uh, Umuver Baton or your testifier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senators, my name is Laylee Fadahi. I am the campaign manager for MN is Ready. We are the state's largest and most diverse coalition of cannabis policy stakeholders. Uh, and we've been working to uh, uh, improve this bill substantively uh, before its passage. Uh, Senator Rasmussen, in order, so what the bill would do is require licensure for any establishment that would be retailing uh, low potency uh, cannabis products. And those low potency products, they would be capped at five milligrams per serving. They still need to be in childproof packaging, um, behind glass, age controlled. Um, but those products, similar to tobacco products, 3 2 beer. Uh, that are available in a variety of places would be available subject to uh, the establishment getting a license to be able to sell those products. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the, the answer on that. And um, you know, th this is going to be a massive expansion of exposure from cannabis products to everyday Minnesotans that are 
specifically not seeking out that product. Um, you know, kids are going to see this on the menu at uh, restaurants. They're going to see it at the grocery store. Um, it is going to be pervasive in, in uh, has the potential to be pervasive in Minnesota retailing, not just for our specific cannabis retailers. And I worry about the, the, mm -hmm. the increase of exposure and what that can mean to usage and abuse of cannabis. Uh, another point I just want to make is I, I think we're, we're frankly conflating issues with uh, the medical marijuana program with broader legalization. I think if, if we have an issue with medical, the medical marijuana program, let's address it. I think there's bipartisan interest and support in making sure that Minnesota has a viable uh, medical marijuana program. But to be clear, the, you know, the licenses that we're talking about in this bill do not require uh, these retailers to have a medical background. They do not require these retailers to have any type of medical uh, training. They will be retailing recreational cannabis. And so I, I get concerned around conflating the idea that by legalizing recreational cannabis, we're actually going to be opening up uh, opportunities for medical marijuana to be served. Um, when in fact, if you are seeking medical marijuana uh, under the direction of a doctor, um, you know, that's very different. And so I just also am concerned that we're conflating those two. We, we can have a robust, a viable medical marijuana program without having it in every grocery store, bar, um, uh, across the state. It, it, so you bring up a point, you know, as we're looking at the medical marijuana, and I don't know, Laylee, is there, I mean, I, you're going to have, there's this vertical integration piece that you hear from the medical uh, marijuana folks, too. You hear about, you know, they want to be supportive of those steps, but, you know, if, if there's certain language that isn't, fix that can strip the medical cannabis companies of their licensing. And you're talking about a license. Somebody has to have a license. Is it then local? And I don't want to get into a state and local government conversation. I could care less, right? I mean, I, I really want to get into the fact that I want to help some things out here. But to that point, um, you know, is this going to be a local control? Is each city going to be able to license? Or is this a state license piece that you're talking about that Senator Rasmussen, I mean, Help me understand, and Senator Rasmussen, is there some fixes you have with this that you're talking to the author about, or is it something that you think our committee needs to get involved in? Or, you know, I guess that's the, I guess the question goes to you and then back to Laley to say, you know, how, how does what Senator Rasmussen is saying make sense? Because it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, I, I, I don't get that. So, again, I'd rather be talking 144G and 245D and 245G. So, uh, go ahead. Uh Senator Hoffman, uh, members of the committee, so the licensure under this bill is issued by the state in both the recreational context and in the medical context. The way this bill has been drafted, and I think some of the amendments that many of you have seen adopted in uh, some of the earlier committee stops, indicate um, that the intent is to maintain a medical cannabis program and to have a medical cannabis program because medical cannabis serves a fundamentally different function uh, in terms of patient care uh, than an adult use market does. I think the reason you hear a lot of testifiers speaking to the benefits of an expanded adult use market for those who seek some of the medicinal benefits of cannabis is because Minnesota's medical cannabis program is famously restrictive and expensive, and so it has been a barrier to people being able to access uh, medical cannabis. And so many of those people end up having to then buy those products off the black market, exposing them to risk. But in terms of public policy, um, the reason that the bill sets up these two separate tracks of licensure, an entirely separate set of um, you know, operational requirements and standards for, for medical cannabis is because fundamentally the two are different and we want to ensure that those that are using cannabis in a therapeutic context um, are doing so uh, you know, within the bounds of a program that's sensitive to that um, and involves going through, you know, a uh, uh, healthcare professional. Thank you. Senator Asperson, then Senator Utke. Yeah, 
Th thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I appreciate that. And I, I just I worry that um, th this this bill and kind of the construct, the starting point for this bill, uh, was really around creating an industry and not trying to address the the uh, behavioral health issues that we as a committee mm -hmm. are tasked with dealing with. And so right. I think there's there's a lot of flaws in terms of uh, exposing uh, Minnesotans uh, to cannabis and not managing the health impacts. I think it's worthy of having a discussion again once we have a fiscal note to see uh, you know how these dollars will be reinvested yep. in in, a, in dealing with some of the serious issues that uh, this legalization will bring along. Um, and then I do think we have to look at um, you know at, at you know can we do this in phases? Is there something this year that we can do on a, a THC fix and maybe even looking at expungement, but waiting until we have some more information on role on, on doing a broader legalization. Can we maybe uh, before licensing, you know, grocery stores and bars to have uh, low potency edible products in there? Can we maybe look at having local control and allowing counties and cities to, to decide if they want to have uh, you know, legalized uh, cannabis retailers in the locations. Mm -hmm. um, th th there's a lot of protections that could be put in this bill. We just, as a committee, as a legislature, have to have the will uh, to do it to keep Minnesotans safe. So let's get this. You, you, you're starting to get into the state and local government conversation on that one, and I, I would, um, I, I think you and I, we need to just watch this as it goes through and the concerns we have from our perspective at Human Services. Um, I. I duly noted, and I hear you loud and clear, just know that, right? So um, thank you for bringing that up. Senator Utke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I missed out on what Senator Rasmussen got to uh, witness here when he asked about cost, because I brought up cost yesterday, and you missed that section of our hearing. So <laughs> I would like to have got you your do? response then, too, because yeah. – uh, and. Um, to the author, or you're a, a co-author, so we can't uh, uh, get t too hard on you, but I think that question has been put forth many times, and I think we're at a point where we deserve those numbers. Yeah. Um, this bill was put together long before session even started, and uh, such, so that's important. We need to see that, um, you know, but the part that we are uh, tasked with in this committee, um, it, it's been brought up here a number of times, uh, you know, we're going to get to talk about substance use disorder and mm -hmm. basically all the bad stuff. Um, part of the bill that's, uh, there's a section in the bill that talks to the fact that you can have five pounds at home. This morning we talked about um, flavored cigarettes and targeting kids and the availability and such. Well, if you've got five pounds as the substance at home, I think the kids have access. And to now we're just making our problem larger for what we deal with in this committee. Um, these costs are gonna go through the roof. Um, something that I haven't brought up myself prior. Um, of course, in this state, Second Amendment is huge. Um, this directly affects the Second Amendment and everybody that's a gun owner. Hmm. Um, and finally, um, <laughs> not to uh, uh, go against Senator Rasmussen, but uh, brought up phasing, I would, uh, <laughs> everybody knows where I stand. If this bill dies today, it's a victory. <laughs> I don't see anything good about this because as you page through it, yeah. um, there are just too many things where we're having to go back and whether it's treatment for adults, yep. treatment for kids, uh, education for kids, all these things. Well, if we got to do all that, it must not be a good deal. So thank yeah. you. No, I, 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 no, thank you, Senator Atkin. Yeah, I probably already knew where you, uh, where your, your position, uh, absolutely. And, and the, but the fiscal piece, right? And we, when, when we were talking about getting the, the three things regarding substance use, and, I, and again, addiction is addiction is addiction. I don't care what it is. The fact is if we don't have the prevention, treatment, and recovery in that same conversation. And there was originally a fiscal note, I think, attached to that, um, Senator Umu Verbaten, that um, in the House, uh, because we didn't know where the fiscal note was going, to your point, again, and to Senator Rasmussen's point, and I know Senator Ayler was part of that conversation, too, is what... You know, um, we don't know the cost of that. And, and, but I have assurance. Remember, assurance, if you don't, you know, all you have is your word in the Senate, right? That's what I'll never forget years ago. I think Jim Ramstead 
said that as a congressman. He said, all you have is your word. Leave your ego in the hallway. All you have is your word. He did say that, right? And it was said that here. So, but with that, um, let's go to Senator Abler. We're going to bring up some amendments to, um, we're, we're knocking on the, the five o'clock um, clock up there. And I'm not going to start singing a song. Uh, even though everything seems to be song related, we had Jay Giles band earlier with Freeze Frame, but you know Senator Abler, and then I think who wanted to go after that? Did anybody on the end? No, Senator Matthews. So Senator Abler, then Senator Matthews, and then um, I think we'll get start getting ready for some amendments. Does that make sense to people? All right, Senator Abler, well, Senator Hoffman. I don't want to rock around the clock with this whole God. thing. Is DHS available for some questions? Um, I don't I'm know. curious that's, about what they anticipate. That's a question. For Although, substances. did somebody didn't somebody just do a, a a bill presentation? My daughter had pointed out that they had. Oh, Aaron Cagle over in the other body was quoting songs from her whole. How did you know that? That's it. My daughter knew that. All right. I don't know. Are we um, in a position that I, as I really want to know, like. You're talking about substance use costs and all that. Uh, I do. There's the Department of Human Services. I, you know, you willing to come on down? Here comes the happy volunteer. So, did I ever tell you the time I worked for the department, Senator Abler? I used to hate these moments when somebody would call you into. Oh yeah. Because you know, it was always that. So you just never showed up. Well, that's why they don't even stand up anymore. I know. That's because they might get called down. Welcome to the committee. I, Tell me, tell us your name and your division, and that would be great. Chair and members, my name is Carrie Briones. I'm the Legislative Director for Direct Care and Treatment, so I may not be helpful on some of the questions you're having, but I'm happy to take them back. Fair uh, warning. Nice. <laughs> Senator Abler, does that do you well? <laughs> yeah, or do you want Christy Grom to also come up here and Matt Burke and anybody Well, the reason she sent Ms. Briones down here is because <laughs> she didn't probably want to come herself. So. Um, and I'm happy to get the answer along the way. Um, okay. And I think, Senator Hoffman, this <laughs> bill may need to come back here to answer these very questions because I think this is not a small matter. Um, so in the governor's legalization bill, there was money for prevention but not treatment, as I recollect. And so um, given the history of, like Montana is a great success story apparently, but most states aren't Montana. They actually have people, more dense populations. And in California, the testimony about treatment and use going up by multi-factors, you can haggle which, what number do you like, two, four times the THC being used. Uh, what do you anticipate is going to be the need for the treatment side of this should this bill go forward? Senator Ailish, let me get this clear. So we're the only ones who brought the language for prevention, treatment, and recovery. That's not in the governor's proposal. Is that what you were just saying? As I believe, I remember they, they presented to us. And well, it was, just, yeah, it was from the commissioner that just talked about prevention and partnerships, but there was no discussion of treatment and there wasn't treatment recovery. In the and that's why we had Senator, or Senator, I just gave Dave Baker uh, over there. And the other body yeah. uh, worked with um, Representative um, Stevenson and, and <laughs> came with that language. So is She's, that current language? Do we know? Christy Grom, is that She's going to come help can, us out. And so, given the time, I, I, this is a question that maybe. I got all the time in the world. At five, we're coming up on five o'clock. I mean, I guess you guys want to stick around past five o'clock, or do you want to just? I, I like mean, being we have, here, Mr. Chair. Anyway, so let's see what. Go ahead, Christy knows. Grom. Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Abler, for the record, Christy Grom with the Department of Human Services. Um, I know we are in the process of completing a fiscal note on this bill, but I don't believe that assessing. A secondary impact to SUD treatment would be part of that analysis. Okay. Um, certainly, we recognize that um, without this bill, there is an exacerbation of substance use disorders right now um, for a variety of reasons, and so um, that's something that we're obviously bringing forward as um, a priority this session as well. Thank you, well, Mr. Chair. Senator Abler, I have some comments after I just finish this question, but um, I don't know. Just actually, it'd be a picture of head exploding, would be what I would say. Um, and Some not because of Ms. Grom, but just because of the, the answer. And I realize you work for the governor, and they have their ideas, and it's a great idea, and they're all behind this bill, and it's a wonderful thing, and nothing bad is going to happen. I think that's the position of the governor, if I state at least my own paraphrase. Some of the testifiers, it's like, it's going to be great. Uh, Senator Umu Verbaten said it's going to be safe, safely done. Um, and if you listen to like half the testifiers who have lived in this world, mm -hmm. um, 
I don't see the safe part. I don't see the no impact part. So let's say it's going to pass. It's our duty to know what is the impact going to be. And so could you just, not now, I'm not, there's nobody I want to embarrass less than you, uh, Ms. Grom. Um, but I, I think it really is important for you all to go to your workshop and never mind the fiscal note. Don't put it in the fiscal note then. And I'm, that, that's a whole different discussion we had earlier about fiscal notes, even with direct savings on the home care bit. Um, but I may be able to take you off the hook and just make my comment, Mr. Chair. So, so Senator, ahead, but I think, you, you I think up, yeah. no, I think your technical assistance piece matters because, again, it comes down to, right, the, the whole thing about prevention, treatment, recovery, right? I mean, yeah. Randy Anderson was running around here earlier during the day, yeah. and there's a guy who knows the outcomes if you don't have good recovery in place, right? And it's like, yeah. um, that still is going to have, because we know, right, number one in treatments is alcoholism, number two is fentanyl, number three is opioids, right? And you look at the amount of people that are going through some kind of addiction and recovery, that's very much our jurisdictional conversation. Yeah. And, and if we're not satisfied with where this bill is going in, in the approach to that, then we need to get satisfied on yeah. that. So I think you. you're providing, get them to provide you technical assistance that you can share with this committee and then we can yeah. decide you know, what's the disposition of this bill um, yeah. when it goes to the next stop. We can bring it back to us. So well, is that, let me am I making for, sense? I yeah, mean, you are. Let me just settle for a right. comment. All right, I'll make just, your comment and then and let's then go. We'll, we'll move along. Okay. Um, I mean, Senator Rasmussen had some really good points and um, this thing's got legs. It's moving. I don't know if you have the votes or not. Um, I, uh, as a former person with substance problems, with this very pro this very substance, uh, and it did not benefit me one bit, and I'm happy I'm here. I made some very foolish choices for which I was not arrested, which might have barred me from being a senator. So anyway, glad to be here. Um, and so, but I, uh, Senator Umo Verbaten, you're an author, clearly a supporter. The department is supporting, I guess. Um, and, but this is not nothing. And you've not sat through as much testimony as we have, probably. Uh, but if you listen to these witnesses, including a couple that were here with their son, uh, this is different than what I used when I was in the 70s. It's way different. But it's um, just far different. I, um, it, and it's not nothing. And this whole psychosis business, which was a reefer madness joke that we got loaded and went to watch in the 70s and laughed at it, um, is actually true of some of these now more potent substances. We have a bill with no potency limit, with no age limit uh, above uh, or below 21. Uh, we have testimony after testimony that there's synaptic harm and permanent damage that comes from under 25 users that I brought up in the other committee. I'm not burdening you with any amendments today. Um, this bill is not nothing. And so Part of why I think it should be a higher age, it would say, look, it is something. A little warning label. I mentioned in the last committee that the warning label that you're going to put on, and we put an, as an amendment this bill saying under 25 should be careful. Well, in my opinion, the college is going to make that into a, a poster and hang it on their wall while they get loaded. Um, and while they suffer some harm, and while some of those kids go into psychosis, and tremendous harm happens to the people around them. And, these, they do bad things, they're not even aware of it. And the, the stories from these families are not made up. They didn't come because they had nothing better to do. And they're extremely worried about this. And so um, to the department, please figure that there's going to be a cost. And the cost, Senator Hoffman and others, the cost to do treatment, which is going to increase, and the harm you have to fix is often irreversible. And there has not been a bill in my recollection that I've ever been brought before us that will cause guaranteed harm to somebody that you have to pay to fix, except for maybe the expansion of legal gambling. And we have to pay for more gambling control for the people who are losing their homes and their families because they can't control it and we make it easy. So, um, I don't know, I just, I, I just, to the authors of the bill, to the supporters of this bill, would you please li listen to the experts who live this world, talking to a well-known drug counselor guy who everybody knows that I didn't get permission to quote him. But lately, the, with the current situations, marijuana is the growth industry that they're doing treatment for. If indeed it goes up twice, only twice, 
there's going to be more. And when it's just that fun to use, like, oh, let's go get loaded. And the governor of Ventura was here, and I enjoyed chatting with him a little bit. That an 18-year-old, because they're in the service, should be able to smoke a joint. Well, sounds reasonable, except that it's pretty harmful. And, and it's our duty in this committee of all to not try to create growth in the industry we're trying to suppress. We've had meeting after meeting about people that are chemically challenged. They, get, they run afoul of it for whatever reason. Is it, their, is it their proclivity? Is it their environment? But it's on us. And so at the very least, Senator Hoffman, we need to know, I had an amendment last meeting, last hearing for 20% should go to treatment. Didn't know the number, I thought we'd solve it today. We don't know the answer today either. But it, it can't yeah. be nothing. And Mr. Chairman, this bill is not nothing. And I just cannot be still while I know that we're working on a project that will indeed harm some people and create more Bacchus families to sit home going, why did you do that to us? I'm done. Thank okay. You. To those points, Senator Abler, um, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, That'll be quite the act to follow up on, but agree with uh, what, what uh, much has been said. Uh, Mr. Chair, the irony is not lost on me that in the same day here in the Senate, we were just on the floor talking about criminalizing the possession of a chunk of metal that's a car part on your car because it's targeted frequently by criminals. Uh, and now within the same day, we're here to talk about decriminalizing a harmful and for a long time illegal drug. Uh, it's talk about Groundhog Day, we're dealing with opposite day on where we are going uh, with our view of different products. And I agree with uh, what was just said. If you pass this bill, uh, which I know is one of your uh, top priorities uh, this year, it will be legal, uh, but it will not be safe. Uh, and many of the testimonies, the stories that have come down here and shared have highlighted areas where we could go in uh, with a scalpel and fix real live needs that are significant needs that have popped up with what our current situation and our current medical programs are. And I bet we'd get strong bipartisan support uh, for some of these, such as, and I'll, I jotted down, Ones that I heard of today, the disparities in criminal penalties, I bet we could get that issue fixed with a large bipartisan support. Uh, because I've heard that uh, myself for a while. I knew we should not be treating different Minnesotans differently. I think there are still some types of offenses that need to be, uh, that need to have serious consequences to it. And then there are others that I think the consequences are too much. We should look at uh, whether it is just uh, for the offense given, uh, but that's not what this bill is. Uh, the access to the medical marijuana program, uh, testimony has pointed out where there are some pretty glaring holes in that area, and I bet this body could have the wherewithal to sit down, roll up our sleeves, and figure out how we get some of those things fixed for people that have real live needs uh, where we need to tweak some of the access it, to that program. And I bet we'd get a large bipartisan support for that problem. But that's not what this bill is bringing us today. I bet we could look at how this could be used for the treatment for opiates. That story comes out uh, regularly here. Maybe that needs to be added as uh, access point to medical marijuana. I don't know. I don't claim to be an expert uh, in that uh, at all. Um, we've, we've had a long and hard look here in the legislature at opiate addiction and, uh, and the uh, synthetic drugs that have been causing a lot of harm and the public's become very aware of that here in the last few years. And we could dive in roll up our sleeves and get that figured out with a large bipartisan basis here in the Senate, but that's not what's in this bill. Instead, it's 250 pages of new language plus an additional 50 pages of statutes being repealed that is a very wide open blanket uh, legalization. And so, you know, there, there are issues with the, the limits, there's no limitations. 
Uh, it's very widespread. Uh, this is just a, a, a blanket decriminalization rather than looking at where should it be, where should, do we need to fix sure. uh, the levels in our criminal system today. Sure. The Second Amendment issue is one I'm, I'm uh, very sensitive to as well. Uh, and Mr. Chair, I would urge you, I think you should uh, exercise your authority uh, to have this bill sit here until we get uh, the fiscal note because there's a long list of committee stops that this has already made it to and uh, uh, you the majority has the authority to get the bill through however they want the deadlines you know you you have the majority uh, in the rules committee you can you don't have to worry about deadlines with this this is one of your priority bills I understand that you have the ability to sit here and do this right uh, I'd urge you to uh, consider doing that. And uh, I'm going to continue to highlight these harms that I see in the bill, the, the lost opportunities that we could have uh, for a bipartisan solutions on here. Uh, and and uh, I'm, I'm not, not a supporter of the issue of just a large blanket uh, legalization of this. So. Thank you. Appreciate you giving me uh, indulgence, Mr. Chair, and uh, that's all I have for now. No indulgence. That's where you're at, Senator Matthews. I appreciate your 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 structure on that, and um, I would have no problem sitting on this bill, right? But there are there are there are things we need to do by next week. I mean, there's a couple of things to to your to your thought process on that. Is um, we have the assurance, and we're going to have some more assurances that if this bill doesn't fit some of the um, things we deem important to our committee, hence our whole discussion on substance use, addiction, where, where's the dollar amount on that, um, we should pull it back into this committee and then have that discussion. Because next week, um, we have a bunch of policy stuff. The stuff we really wanted to work on that we all signed up to work on, I didn't sign up to work on on this. Absolutely didn't, right? Um, um, if I sit on it, then we're going to sit there and is it going to come up? Is it not going to come? Where if, if we move it, if we move it with our whatever we do with that, whether it's no recommendation or we move it to the next, you know, place, right? With then we can get our stuff done that we need to policy-wise because we only have two more times that we meet. We have a ton of policy bills in front of us, and so. You know, I, I'm, I'm open to anything. I mean, there's a policy bill that we need to get done, a DHS needs completely today. You know, we need to, to do that today, and it looks like we're not going to get to that, right, unless we, you know, move on, you know, past 5 o'clock, which I, I, I'm okay with that. But I hear your point, and I, I appreciate that. Senator Mitchell from Woodbury. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so my comment on this, uh, and I, I say this as someone who also has addiction in the family, um, but as someone who my entire adult life has worked with children, um, children at um, abuse shelters, sh children at homeless shelters, um, abused, neglected kids, big brothers, big sisters, now as a foster parent. Um, and as someone who has never touched any of this stuff and possibly never will, I've been in the military since I was 17. I get drug tested, you know, this is, I have no vested interest in this. Um, my two points are, one, it, it doesn't matter what it is, someone is going to abuse it. Mm -hmm. Whether it's alcohol, whether it's a vehicle, which you can also kill someone with, which it, it doesn't matter what some, something is, someone can figure out a way to do some harm with it. Mm -hmm. um, I will also say, as someone who is around kids a lot, if they want to be using marijuana, they are already using marijuana. And my one comfort with this, even though it's hard for me to understand, is that I would rather that people be able to get something if they're going to use it anyway from a safe source than the places that kids are getting these things from now. Because we did hear some really traumatic stories today, but marijuana isn't recreationally legal 
and all the stories we heard came from people that got it anyway. So I would rather know that the kids that I work with, if they're going to go do it, they are not getting it from a drug dealer who might also be putting God knows what into it, who might also be saying, hey, you should try this too, or might bring them around a suspicious element in other ways. So as much as it's hard for me to understand this issue because this just isn't my space, I see this as a way to actually protect our children because it's going to be more controlled and we're going to know what's in it and we're not going to bring them potentially around a criminal element. And I especially think that we shouldn't be having something that is so disparately treated in terms of the criminal aspect of it if someone is using the way it is right now. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Um, Senator Mayquaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and <clears throat> I won't be redundant. Uh, Senator Mitchell said a lot of, of what I was thinking is that, you know, right now it is an entirely unregulated market in the state of Minnesota, which yep. means that um, people who are growing it here, bringing it here, selling it here, all of these are crimes. Um, we are creating an underground and black market for this to, or we are allowing it to, to exist. Um, this closes that down. This creates that strong regulation. And I think <clears throat> perhaps most importantly is we undo some of the harm that has been caused by the war on drugs. And um, I really want to, there's this quote that sticks out to me. I remember hearing it. Um, my mom showed it to me however many years ago when, when she found it. And I, like, I Googled it because it was shocking. But this is the assistant to the president for domestic affairs under President Nixon. And he said, do you want to know what the war on drugs was really about? The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to either be against the war or black, but by letting the public associate them with marijuana and then criminalizing them heavily, we could disrupt their communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. And so... You know, the most addictive, I mean, you said it, the most addictive substance that we have is legal. It's alcohol. Um, and it's not just, like, for sale and, I mean, it's everywhere. And it's everywhere in our media. And it's everywhere in our books and our movies and our TV shows. And um, this is bringing something that people are already using into regulation. And I think part of the reason we probably don't have a fiscal note is that this is a massive bill. It's creating new agencies, it's creating grant programs, it's, you know, it's doing all these things. And I think there's been more than 50 amendments to the bill since it started moving the committee process, which I'm assuming every time there's an amendment to the bill, it changes how much it costs. So um, I don't want to hold up the bill. I'd actually like to get it through its initial committee stop so that we have as close to the final bill as we're going to have so that we can actually get that accurate fiscal note because I would be furious if I was this committee. I mean, I'd love to see an education too, so I'll just admit my um, personal interest there. But um, I'd be really mad if it came through this committee and we got a fiscal note and it said one thing and then it goes to education, they amend it and it says something, you know, so I, I want to know what it's going to be. No. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, may I offer an amendment? You have, yeah, there's a couple sitting on my sheet. Do you have one you want to offer? I do. I'm going to offer the A84 amendment. A84 amendment is going to get handed out. Do you want to explain your A84 amendment? I would love to. This will not impact any fiscal notes, um, and it's mostly technical. Um, it changes um, references to pregnant women, breastfeeding women, and women who may become pregnant to just individuals. We know that not every person who is pregnant or can become pregnant or who breastfeeds or nurse or chest feeds identifies as a woman, and I would hate for... Um, language to be limiting in people who can access substance use disorder uh, treatment or information or um, education. So that is what this amendment does. And I have ch checked with the chief author and the co-author, and they, well, I'll let Senator Umu Verbaten say that, but I, it's not coming out of nowhere. Senator Umu Verbaten, do you see this as a friendly amendment? Mr. Chair, yes, I do. A friendly amendment has been doing that. So Senator Rasmussen to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question, was this amendment in our, in our folder or was this uh, circulated to the committee ahead of time? Uh, 
Senator uh, Rasmussen, Senator, no, that's uh, it was. There was a whole bunch of amendments that were that were thrown because we were on the engrossment side. A lot of this stuff was not circulated ahead of time, but it was shot at 4:47 p.m. is when this amendment was given to you. So, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I I just would. Uh, you know, ask members to oppose the amendment. Um, and the reason being is this actually amends an amendment that I had earlier on in the Commerce Committee, which was taking a, a health safety label, I believe, uh, that um, matches what I believe the CDC has for tobacco and for other products. And um, if I'm mistaken, I uh, would be happy to be corrected, but I'm just worried that it'll be amending an amendment that was discussed in a previous committee with the bill author, accepted by the bill author, and that I haven't had time to understand how this amendment will impact the health uh, warning that we added in commerce. Senator Mayquay, do you have a response to the question from Senator Rasmussen? Mr. Chair, I wonder if we could ask counsel to just to respond to that. My understanding is that this doesn't change any of the um, health labels, health warnings. It just accurately describes mm -hmm. pregnant people, breastfeeding people um, with terminology that's more up to date. And my fear, to be honest with you, Mr. Chair, is that at some point, somebody who doesn't identify as a woman who is pregnant wouldn't be able to access some of these things for whatever reason, because we haven't written it into law. So the concern of Senator Rasmussen is, will this, <laughs> will this affect the, the amendment that he had on commerce, which was consistent with federal guidelines, I suppose, right? So somebody from council want to, that would be Mr. Monahan. Needs a moment. That's okay. While they're discussing that, I just wanted to say something. And this is going to be a quote, I think. We talk about uh, our, our role and what we do in this committee. And I, and I want to just, this is something. It's, it's prime for this. The silver tsunami and long-term care crisis is more certain and potentially more devastating than any future potential recession. I just wanted to throw that out as a word of thought. Those are the things that we really want to get to on this committee, and I, I appreciate you um, hanging in there with us and as we get this factored out, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I may, while we're, we're waiting, I know many of us are juggling many, many priorities, and I, I uh, also wanted to say to Senator Matthews, I serve on the Judiciary Committee. I really ran for office to work on those criminal justice reforms. I'm carrying a number of bills. I'd love to work with you on them um, if you want to take a look at, at what I have um, coming up in that committee. But um, this is one important piece of it. Um, and, uh, you know, I know Senator Hoffman is going to get your committee back on track and um, the human services work. But... Um, this is an important piece of, of, of addressing those racial disparities. And you'll see a lot of other legislation that I'm carrying on that. I'd love to work with you on it. Thank you. We're still, uh, we're still talking over here. So Senator Matthews, it sounds like you got a commitment to have a partner over there to work on your lawyerly stuff. Are you a lawyer too? Mr. Chair, no. Aha. Uh -huh. Lawyer. <laughs> Senator Matthews. <laughs> oh, no, I will. Uh, I'm happy to look over uh, what bills you have introduced uh, so far, and we can definitely have those conversations. I thought we had one expunging. I thought there was one of decriminalization. Isn't that one that, that, that we're already on? I mean, there's some ones that are that are out there that are worth, yeah. So, but I'm glad to hear that. So, 
we don't have another committee coming in after this, do we? Mm. Mr. Chair. Senator Asmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to take a look at uh, the amendment, and it, it does not impact the specific health label that I had mentioned, so I appreciate the time to take a look at that. Would still, you know, I, I think especially with an amendment like this where it's touching multiple pages, and at least I haven't had the opportunity to understand how it impacts the underlying legislation, you know, I, I would ask, you know, members to consider opposing this. Um, and uh, just because I, I frankly still don't know the impact, and I, I frankly think other than Senator May Quaid, I don't know if, if the rest of us do either. So to that point, it doesn't affect the underlying first comment that you had. So Senator May Quaid. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to just read the things that it changes if it's helpful. Um, I'm, I'm good on time. I mean, I, I made a commitment to hear this bill, and if we're here till midnight, so be it. If we go into Friday, Double mitzvah, Shabbat Shalom. I'm having a great time here, right, Dan? So go ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, 21.16. A coordinated, I'm just going to read what it will be. A coordinated education program to educate pregnant individuals, breastfeeding individuals, and individuals who may become pregnant on the adverse health effects of cannabis flower and cannabinoid products. 21.17. Oh, that was 21.17. Uh, 116 is the next section. One sixteen point three zero five percent of the money is for grants to educate pregnant individuals, breastfeeding individuals, and individuals who may become pregnant on the adverse health effects of substance use. One eighty six dot one four. Education for pregnant and breastfeeding individuals, individuals who may become pregnant. Um, there's also above there on 186.4 by pregnant or breastfeeding individuals. Discourage the personal use of cannabis flower or cannabinoid products by pregnant or breastfeeding individuals. Um, 186.17. The Commissioner of Health in consultation with the Commissioners of Human Services and Education shall conduct a long-term coordinated program to educate pregnant individuals, breastfeeding individuals, and individuals who may become pregnant on the adverse health effects of prenatal exposure to cannabis flower or cannabinoid products etc. Uh, 186.21. This education program must also educate individuals on what constitutes a substance use disorder, signs of substance use disorder, and treatment options for persons with substance use disorder. Last one is 246.13. Of the amount appropriated under paragraph A, blank in fiscal year 2024 and blank in fiscal year 2025 are for education for Individuals who are pregnant, breastfeeding, or who may become pregnant. That is the amendment. Thank you, Senator to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would uh, uh, request that members vote no on this amendment. And I just happen to have the 186.4 in front of me. I've had that up the whole time. But we're by a pregnant or breastfeeding woman. Our creator made, created male and female, man or woman, that's been with us through all of time. It's a breastfeeding woman. There, that's all it is. We can't do anything differently. So uh, please leave it as is and vote no. All right. Seeing uh, uh, Senator Matthews to the amendment, and then, um, uh, then as soon as you're done, I'm going to just uh, A4 amendment. Uh, uh, Senator Mayquay moves the A4 amendment. So go ahead, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd add to that, I'd also urge a no vote. Mr. Chair, this is the type of amendment that you're trying to not characterize this committee by, uh, and I would encourage a, a no vote on that. Uh, the language in the underlying um, uh, bill uh, would be correct, and I would uh, urge members to uh, not distract off of that issue uh, with what the underlying bill has. So I would... Uh, urge members to vote no. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator May Quaid. Uh, M Mr. May Chair, I'll vote. just encourage a yes vote. Um, a high percentage of LGBTQ people, including transgender and gender expansive people, um, are in substance use disorder treatment and experience substance use disorder, and I do not want to keep them out of the ability to access uh, treatment 
education and services because we have written this bill narrowly. Whether folks agree with it or not, um, some people who are breastfeeding or pregnant do not identify as women, and they are legally not identified as women. They are gender expansive or transgender, and we don't want to leave them out of these services. I get that. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. All in favor of the A84 amendment by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. It is adopted. Um, a, in front of you members... Um, that is a good discussion, by the way, because my daughter could hear Mr. male, Chair. female, woman, man. So, Senator Senator Umu Verbaten, yes. Uh, just while we're on uh, sort of technical amendments, I believe the A81 is a technical amendment that we need. Technical. Who brought that forward, uh, Senator Umu Verbaten? Do you know who's the committee that who's the who brought that technical fix forward? Do you know offhand? Is that the department? Mr. Chair. Yeah, Senator Redke. Is it actually 81 or is it 80? A, I have the 80. A81 the is what you're looking at. It should be the, and it's being handed out right oh, now. Oh, okay. That, I am so that, sorry. That, sorry, because that's what, all I had was the 80. Me and too. I was wondering I was if it was right. The 80, 81. Yeah, so you you got it okay. now. Well, so sorry. looks like, Senator Redke, when you get it in front of you, <laughs> members, um, Mr. Chair, it might have come from council, but. Go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Monahan. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, um, at this bill's last stop, there was an oral amendment. And when I stated the oral amendment, I didn't realize that the word uh, patient appeared twice on the line. And as a result, when it was engrossed, they changed the wrong patient to parent. So we're, we're correcting that mistake that was made at the last stop. Duly noted. Uh, <laughs> Senator Rasmussen uh, moves the A81 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Thank you. I'm glad we can make our corrections here. Now, Senator Utke, in front of you is the A80 amendment. That is mine. Um, members, let me explain that if I can do so. There was a bill that was done earlier this morning, and it specifically gets to the local and tribal health departments, right? That's nope. That's 82. That's 82. I, I need to go back to school, Senator Umu Verbatim. But no, this one is specifically the A80 is, is on the local public health association of Minnesota on association. Sorry, Brian, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I saw you sweating back there. But... Um, in that is the uh, local and tribal health departments distribute grants to local health, local, this gets to the local health departments and the tribal health departments uh, disseminating the educational materials on cannibals, flour, and cannabo cannabinoid products, uh, prevention, training, education, technical assistance, community engagement among those products. It's a local thing. This is Good to see this language in here. And the author of the bill said yes to this. Am I not mistaken on that, Senator? Mr. Chair, yes. So A80 in front of folks. Uh, all the, uh, yes, thank you, Senator Atke. I'm glad we're, we're realizing that. Uh, all those in favor of the A80, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same side. It is adopted. <laughs> Senator Abler. So, again, related to the amendment, I withdrew um, in the other committee. Um, I just, you want to be sure, <laughs> I mean, I, we, spent our, we spent our whole time last year talking about Jake. We did. This kid right who uh, ran afoul all the drugs and wound up dying. And uh, mom tried to help and all that. And he went to treatment a number of times, lots of times. And so... Um, this is not going to save all the people, but it's really important that there's enough money in here to save all the people that we can. And I'm concerned that a fixed dollar amount compared to a percentage will not grow with the growth of the industry. So that's just a comment for the future to the authors and the advocates. Um, you know, you're, I'll leave it at that. I already made my speech. Thank you. So, so to that point, Senator Abler, I think you and I both will be having that conversation um, because if clearly that isn't addressed the way that our committee feels it should be addressed, I have no problem bringing this bill back to this committee and having a 
deeper conversation on that. So um, send that message to the authors of the bill. That would be wonderful. I would love that. So members, the A82 amendment is in front of you. Can you please pass that out? And there'll be another one, because I'm going to get this right. There's going to be an amendment to the amendment. So the A82, and then you're getting an amendment to the amendment. And yes, there is a song. Senator May Quaid, you want to make sure. Did I get that right? There's an amendment to the amendment. The clerk shall report the amendment. That's all right. So members... Are you looking at the A82 and the A83, the amendment to the amendment? Do you want to explain? Do you want me to explain to you what I'm doing, or should I move the uh, amendment to the amendment on the amendment? That should be an A83. So you got an A82. You haven't gotten it yet, Paul? 82, did they give you the 83? All right, coming down. Oh, I thank you. And you lawyers that are up here, I, I make the motion for the amendment first, correct? Yes. And I don't take action on the amendment. I move the amendment, and then Senator Abler is going to move the amendment to the amendment, correct? And then we take a action on the amendment to the amendment in the amendment, correct? Dr. Wilkland, am I like? Am I conf isn't this just confusing to you as it is to me? I mean, this is, this is. You got this? Did you get the amendment to the amendment to the amendment? Senator Hoffman, I'd like to move the amendment to the amendment if I knew what number it was. So you're getting an A83, Senator Abler. I'd like to move the A83 amendment. It's coming. Even though I haven't, it's a sight unseen amendment, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So this I'm morning, um, in Senator Wicklund's committee, there's um, our. our our brothers and sisters in the tribal, Indian tribal um, medical boards, medical programs, right? We, we, we got that to be moved in, in the omnibus bill and then realizing that if, if Senate File 73 makes it to the end, then half of the bill that was accepted today would be null and void. And so there were some um, concerns that were brought up in that. So hence, members, what you have is the bill from this morning now getting attached to the Senate File 73 to, to help keep it clear, clean, and protected because it's going to be by itself in an omnibus bill. But if this passes and it's not protection, it is in there. So what you see in the amendment, folks, so I'm going to move the A82. I already did. Thank you, Senator Abler. And then Senator Abler is going to move the, um, the amendment to the amendment, A83. So the A we already did that, so good. We're on both of those. Mr. And Chair? Yes. I just wanted to say thank you. I had a chance to review all these and talk with um, Senator Port beforehand, so definitely supportive. All right, so we're supportive of that. Any questions regarding what we're trying to do here? Go ahead, you guys. I, I, you or Mr. Omar Chair. Fate is going to bring something. Go ahead. I'll just, I, don't, I just want to know why we need the amendment that I offered. So is there, if we don't, like, is this, are these programs all going to terminate with the bill? And so this just carries them forward for a little while. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Senator Edke to that bill and then Leah Monaghan to that, to that point. Mr. So, Chair? Yes? I think you and I had a few of those same questions in previous years when somebody handed us amendments. <laughs> I, I remember that. I think that, this is Senator, pretty funny. Think, this is funny. Actually, this is funny. This is funny. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Monahan, will you explain to the good senator from Anoka what we're trying to do, or even though we would have the same questions because he would add amendment on amendment on amendment, and nobody knew what he was doing. So go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, it's not so interesting as that it... Um, I needed to print the big amendment, and I hadn't finished it okay. in order to print nine pages and staple them. Yeah. So then I created a second amendment while the first was printing. 
so that okay. I could get the complete amendment here no, by but, 3 o'clock. So, Mr. Chair, my, actually my question is why do we need effective dates to have it terminate? Liam, you want to tell them that? I think it's very cute to have it that way. It's kind of like a Mr. whole effective Chair, date amendment. I ran members, um, Senator Hoffman's uh, bill from this morning was amending the medical cannabis, the existing medical cannabis program. Senate File 73 repeals the entirety of the existing language. So if he were to amend that, um, it would then be repealed. But he also creates new sections, which wouldn't be repealed. So we needed to repeal those as well Thank upon you. the effective date of 73. Thank you. Members, any more questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question, since this uh, amendment before us is impacting uh, the tribes, have, have all 11 of Minnesota's tribes been consulted, and do they approve of this amendment? Can I get a thumbs up from the back of the gallery there? Here's a thumbs up. Yes, actually, this, this protects the bill that they were all part of this morning. This actually now protects them. Former Representative Bill Haas, <laughs> yeah. Mr. Chair and Senator, um, there is no opposition from the tribes. This is an open bill that any tribe can participate if they want. And uh, so the only two tribes that are taking advantage of this at this point is Red Lake and White Earth. And I represent White Earth Tribal Nation. Is that quick enough? in order to, to get to that point, right? Um, when you're looking at the medical producers in the adult rec market, uh, it's on, my mic is on now, it was off, so. Isn't it great when people are telling you what to do that you just kind of just kind of sit back and it's, apparently my mic was off, but you guys can hear me now. But, but I think one of the things we wanna do is, I appreciate the fact that Senator Port and uh, is specifically opening your doors to the to the folks like Rich Ginsburg and Tom Lehman and Andrea Rao and those those folks that 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 are in the medical uh, cannabis industry, right? I guess there's some question about this. Okay. And I just wanted to make it uh, very clear that that you know I hope that I hope that Olive Branch is still extended, and I hope that we can come. And you heard the the concerns that this committee has. Um, as as the the person in this committee, I, I want to say that I I will I will be with my committee members on on that. If it doesn't doesn't fit, we got to have a conversation on it. So I appreciate you bringing this bill, and I think we're moving it to commerce for no jobs, jobs labor, labor labor. 
Labor. We're going to labor on this one, right? So. Mr. Chair, yes. Did I get everything I needed to do on amendments? Do you have another amendment? No, Mr. Chair. No, you sure? Yeah. Positive. Positive. All right. With that, uh, Senator Fate moves as amended, amended to the amended, right? As amended, Senate File 73 be passed and re referred to labor. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. It is passed and moved on. Thank you. Chair, Thank you, Mr. Actually, Chair. We actually have to finish saying I know before you get the gavel. Just so you, know. like, you were like the no and the gavel were simultaneous, so I was going to point that out. Was it really? Yeah, it was. I'm sorry. I do you want you, to redo you that again? No, it's fine. I'm I mean, just, I can redo it was it meant again. to be a little funny, but it's like. No, I was just like, <laughs> you know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. See you. Um, you guys want to take up the DHS bill, and it's we need to get this. It's a policy one, or do you want to do it next week? Honestly. Oh, let's hold on. Let me just give you a second. To meet first deadline, it has a second stop. To meet first deadline, it has a second stop. So um, you got you got a quorum. Bring it up here. No one's going to vote against this. It's a technical bill. You know, let's you know, folks got to go do what they need to do, and I'll I'll move it. So, right. Does that work? Wouldn't be the first time that this has happened, so. And this is going to judiciary, second stop. So, so whoever's hanging out, Christy, if you want to. And I know this is one that, yeah, this should be. Mr. Chair, I'm ready when you are. Okay. Senator May Quaid, we, the quorum, let me just establish something. Um, we don't need a quorum. The quorum was already established to get the meeting going. So you know what? It's, it's all good. We're going to, you know, take your bill and run with it. So Senator May Quaid. Let's do it. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, this is a DHS policy bill. It is some technical changes and some substantive changes. Um, we are making changes to disability and substance use disorder services. There's a codification of a culture of safety, um, which is an existing pilot, makes permanent. There are some technical changes in terminology. We codify the definitions of direct and indirect financial interest as they relate to HCBS disability programs. There's clarifications aligning with law with intent related to foster care moratorium exceptions. There's a change related to substance use disorder treatment, making it easier for families to access substance use disorder treatment together. Um, it removes the sunsets for three, um, well, uh, several uh, advisory councils, mm -hmm. and there's some effective date uh, clarifications. And to get the bill in the order that I would like it in, Mr. Chair, I would like to move the A1 amendment. A1 is being handed out. No, it's in the packet. In the your packet. A1 is in your packet. Yes. Uh, Senator Quay, May Quay moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Was that delay long <laughs> enough for you, Senator Abley? Thank you. Senator Mayquaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then I would also like to offer the A2 amendment. Um, this is uh, updated to. And that is being handed out, yes, Senator, thank correct? You. So, members, the A2 is being handed out. Tell us what's going on with the A2. Uh, this is, it updates the language to align with what it actually is. Yeah. You can. Mr. Chair. Senator Abler. Just while we're waiting, is this considered the technical bill or is this a policy bill? Senator Mayquaid or I think Ms. Ms. Grom? Grom would like that. Uh, Senator Abler, um, both. <laughs> so there's some policy changes in here. Yes. There, there are some policy changes into it, yes. So just if I could, and I, I don't mind talking to you, but I've just, if Ms. Um, uh, Grom would just, is, is anything in here controversial policy changes? Is anybody going to like, we're doing this awfully quick. I haven't even read the bill. Well, I, so is, oh, is, is this, is anything, I'm, I, I trust you a lot, but is, 
Is there anything else you want to explain to us that's done differently? Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Abler, Christy Grom, go Senator ahead. Senator Abler, um, uh, there are, most of this bill is comprised of technical and kind of conforming changes. There are a few substantive changes, but they've all been vetted with stakeholders. So we have really done our due diligence over the interim to work with all impacted stakeholders and we have not heard of any concerns. Um, once we get the bill in the order um, that Senator McQuaid would like it, I can walk through some of the more substantive changes to make sure that you're um, well aware of what those are. And I'd be happy to talk with you, you know, here during committee or, or after committee. And if there are any issues, we do have another stop so we could yeah. um, also Senator Abler. I well, just, I mean, uh, a very, very brief would be fine. So just okay. like, like one sentence of four things or something. All right. I'll just, and, and Mr. Chair, I think the A2 amendment is phenomenal. Senator Abler. <laughs> That's funny. May, Senator May Quaid, A2 amendments in front of us. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. It passes. How was that delay? Senator May Quaid. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, members, um, all of my previous comments remain. The, the uh, technical changes were just that, technical changes. Um, so this is a, a policy bill and a technical bill at the same time. Um, I don't think I need to walk through those things again, but I would be glad to if you have questions. Um, I don't want to rush anybody, but there is nothing controversial in here. We're not legalizing adult use cannabis, for example, in this bill. So, Senator McQuaid, um, you just changed on the self-directed waiver services and min choices. Can you point me to a line, Mr. Chair? Yeah, um, 27.14. I see what you did. You're just realigning that with current. You're just aligning this up to statute. What, what put me off, uh, Christy, was that uh, upon federal approval, but yeah, whatever. Right? It, it's, just, it's just the process. I'm good It's because it's been a long day. So all they did, um, all you did was, was align 256B-49, subdivision 23, and it just, it's 492, subdivision 1. It's just a change. It's a technical change. So to Senator Abler's point, it's, it's being changed it's a re mr. chair it's yeah. a reference update so that it's referencing the correct part of statute yeah miss crumb mr. chair this this is a, um, a cross-reference update one of the things that we found when we were looking at the definition of uh, community settings was that inadvertently it wasn't applied to the um, to the DD waiver under 256B092. Instead, it was just applied to 256B49. Under our federally approved waiver plans, those DD. definitions exist mm -hmm. um, for both, for all of our disability waivers, both under 49 and 092, 256B49 and 092. Um, and so what we did was we moved all of that language to a new section that covers both of the waivers, 256B.492. So nothing is being, um, that subdivision is being uh, removed and, and repealed in this bill, but all of the language that was in there is going into 256B.492. Thank you. Mr. Monahan, no. Does this, does this line up the kitchen cabinets, there, Senator Amor? Mr. Chair, this is the kind of stuff that, with all respect, Ms. Grom and Mr. Monahan would talk about at parties and people would not want to sit by them. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair. <laughs> Senator Abler, if, um, it's, it starts on uh, 30.27, where you can see it all uh, I love this. combined she's just, together. She's just like taking this. What did you really study this? This is well like, done. I, she's very good. I love good. this. Yes. I'm full of joy on this. This is like, a, yes. Like, must be a chair's gold star you can award, or like just a commendatory something. Way to be. I don't know. You, I don't know. I, you just, where's that key? He just well, left. Gone, you know, yeah. you, he never right. prepared like this, Mr. Chair. Any other questions regarding um, any of the HCBS stuff? I'm prepared to vote. So, Senator Mayquade, what do you want to do with this bill? Mr. Chair, I'm prepared to vote, but I know the bill very well. So you want to you wanna pass this bill as amended and refer it to judiciary, correct? correct? Mr. Chair, yes. So be it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. It's on its way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, members. Do you want to keep Thank you. Sure. Thank you. We are adjourned.
I do.